Okay, so members, you're all very welcome to this afternoon's Executive Office Committee meeting being held virtually. Um, I would just ask members as ever to bear with us should we have any technical problems as we're rolling out, but hopefully we should be okay. If we could start with item one, which is apologies, and as I understand it, we have received no apologies from anybody for the meeting, so that's all good. Uh, in terms of item two, chairman's business, just to update members that we had an informal, I had an informal meeting yesterday with the chair of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. That was a meeting between the chairs of the invitation went to the chairs of the committees of the assembly, and a semi-formal arrangement has been proposed for conversations between uh, the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee assembly committee chairpersons in relation to matters to do with the EU. And there was talk of that being extended uh, for Dublin, Cardiff uh, and Edinburgh as well, just to keep a, a formal flow, because there's been quite a lot of conversations with committees here and committees there. And it's just a, maybe an effort to try and bring that together on a more formalised basis. And um, the secretariat will be provided by the uh, Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and the chair would be uh, rotated. So just to update members on that that took place yesterday. Um, also, um, maybe just in light of the short notice of the statement yesterday from the First and Deputy First Minister on the COVID recovery plan, maybe that the committee should write uh, and ask that the committee be included in the development and discussion uh, on plans for the recovery. There are obviously quite a number of elements of that that will uh, reach across what we're doing within the Executive Office Committee. So maybe just to write and say to, to keep us in mind for any of the elements that are relevant to that. Members agree to that? Great. Okay. Uh, then draft minutes then is item three. The draft minutes of the meeting held on the 17th of February at page six of the meeting pack. Uh, are members content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings? Great. Okay. So they will be uh, signed and sent across. Uh, item four is matters arising. So on page 14 of the meeting pack, uh, there is a joint statement by the co-chairs of the EU-UK Joint Committee. Uh, are members content to note that? Okay. And on page 15 of the meeting pack uh, is an update on the EU exit matters, which was expected in advance of the briefing session with the junior ministers last week. But it's contained in the papers for this week. So that's there for noting as well. So if members are content at that stage, then we will move on to the item five, which is the High Street Task Force. And as I say, we do have a number of various groups uh, that will be presenting. Just again, for, for note, what will happen is that members, along with everyone else, will move down into the audience and only those that are presenting will be in the spotlight. What that means for me as chair is that only people that I can see are those that are in the spotlight. I cannot see people that are down uh, in the uh, audience. And that just, it helps for those that say, I was waving furiously at you, but I can't see you. So it's not that I'm ignoring people. I literally can't see you when you move down into there. But we will get um, representatives from the Northern Ireland Local Government Association. And we have Derek McCallum, who is the Chief Executive Officer. We also have Alderman uh, Stephen Mutre from Armagh, Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council and Suzanne Wiley, the Chief Executive of Belfast City Council. So hopefully we have those guys up in the spotlight now and we can pass over to yourselves to give us a few minutes of an introduction and then we'll maybe get some questions. Chair and committee members, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Yes. That's, that's a good start. Thank you for the invitation. It's welcome and it's certainly very timely. My name is Stephen Moutry and amongst other things, I chair Nilga's All Council Economy Group. With me is Suzanne Wiley, representing Council of Chiefs. And as you know, Suzanne is Chief Executive Officer of Belfast City Council and also Derek McCallum, Nilga's Chief Executive who also has direct experience of town centre design and management here and also in Scotland. Today is a sprint, but transforming high streets is a marathon. 
The task force, when set up, was widely welcomed. Nilga joined it by invitation from the start. We asked that it works smart, that it works fast, that it doesn't duplicate, that it included villages, that it does bid for investment and transfers the investment locally. It must have outcomes led by local high street partners and embed high streets in the programme for government of the Assembly. It remains to be seen whether all of this will come to pass, but we welcome the initiative which, if delivered through councils, will see things happen faster, better and more sustainably. Sure, we're aware time is tight, so I want to move straight to Suzanne. Suzanne. Thank you, um, Stephen, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, really good to be here. Um, and uh, of course, I'm sure all of the stakeholders you're going to listen to this afternoon um, are, are going to be very much in favour of the High Street Task Force, um, very much. First, there's a very come back um, to that, but um, I guess um, that um, is required because of all the various stakeholders that are involved here. Um, obviously, our high streets, um, whether or not uh, that's in a village, in a town centre or in a city, we're already uh, struggling. We're already struggling from the, the, the huge strategic shift in terms of, of retail. Um, and we were already at local council level and with some of the stakeholders around this table, reimagining what our um, high streets uh, and towns and city centres should actually look like and, and getting on with quite a lot of work um, on that. But I think we all know that this is a cross-cutting issue. That's obviously why um, the TEO um, committee is so interested interested in this and will need to stay cross-cutting if we're actually going to solve um, some of these problems that um, COVID has shown a real spotlight um, on. Um, we all want to see this task force succeed. We want to see it move quickly. Um, and uh, But to do so, we need to make sure that we have the right access to the mechanisms that are going to um, be required for policy change and also for investment um, in our towns and villages and then also for delivery. Um, and we need clarity um, in terms of how all of that um, will happen. And I'm happy to take um, questions on, the, on that. This is real place-based recovery. Um, and it will require that absolute joined up partnership between local councils, stakeholders, um, sectors and businesses and executive um, departments and a number of executive departments. I mean, without the vibrancy um, of those high streets, we're going to struggle in terms of getting people to live there and getting people to invest there, to create jobs there, tourists to go and visit there, um, etc. And of course, it affects our planning policies, our transport policies, our cultural strategies, and even um, the levelling up agenda that, that is happening um, and being discussed now um, at Westminster um, level. So I think the task force is set up now is very well placed to come up with the what, the advice as to actually what needs needs to happen. You have enough expertise around um, that, that table to do that. I think the who and the how is going to be more of a challenge for us. And I think that's something that we would um, like um, the TU um, committee to, to consider and that Derek will, will follow up on. So um, I think that um, some of the things we'd like just to highlight um, to you that need to be sought through more. And of course, the task force has only had its first meeting, so it's very, very early days. Um, but we would not want to, it to go into a huge process. Um, you know, we've set up some subgroups, um, which is the right thing to do. Um, but clearly, there needs to be clear timeframes set for the task force to report back and to give an action plan as to what we think now needs to happen. And then that has to be considered in the right way um, across um, the COVID task force and, and through government departments. So the first thing I would say is um, timeframes need to be really, really clear. The second thing I would say is it needs to be really clear that we have the right links to how we will be able to influence policy change, whether that's planning policy or whether that's rates policy, um, and also then how we will link to financial support 
support that will be required, whether that's financial support for businesses to prop them up, um, or whether that's financial um, support around regeneration investment or housing investment um, or revitalization funds that DFC um, Mark II that DFC um, ruled out in the first phase um, of COVID. Um, so we, um, I would also say, again, just to appeal, we're not starting from scratch. A lot of work has been um, done. Um, and we also are, you know, are very aware that um, the Chancellor announced um, funds for um, High Street uh, recovery um, just this week. Uh, and that, that, that they are envisaged to, to prop up the businesses, of course, um, but they're envisaged also to work through a real partnership between central and local government, and clearly that's what we'd like to see. So I'd like to hand over to Derek now, just to complete the presentation. Sure, just a few sentences, very conscious of time. Um, as Susanna said, impact is key. Impact is very key. And the programme for government and the task force should adopt a policy of divest and devolve. And what I mean by that is that as we're speaking, the Chancellor is announcing a £5.8 billion pounds High Street Restart Fund. Consequentially, that's £170 million for Northern Ireland. I think that should be distributed via councils per the rest of the UK. Ultimately, Chair, and conscious of time, we all know about the, the radical approach that's needed here where resources, power and resources have to be locality-based driven. It's the only way to do the re-imaging and the transformation that Suzanne and Alderman Mutley, Mutley uh, referred to. And, and we do see a vision here where we're turning cities, towns and villages from areas where boundaries are overseen by public servants and regulators, Chairman, to economic systems with delivery teams within communities and they include the partners who are going to speak to you later today, our business and our community colleagues. That may seem radical, but it's more of a culture change and a trust local talent thing than anything overbearing. Alderman Mutri will close our short comments now with your indulgence, Chair. Thank you. As the committee knows, good practice has been and will be harvested by many of those giving evidence, Chairman, today, including our councillors. We know of many cities like Toronto leading the way. Be best practice can also be tailored. If councils are given legislative and fiscal tools to do so, if Commonwealth countries in Africa can develop a smart villages approach to rural development, the 11 councils can competently tailor this with local partners to transform our high streets long after the task force has performed its role. Indeed, the high street task force should be task and finish, while the high streets and those who use them must be infinite. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. And I am going to pass over now. I think we have uh, Pat Sheehan is looking to ask a question. Pat? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, and thanks to the panel. Good to talk to you again, Suzanne and Stephen, uh, and welcome to Derek as well. I just wanted to ask a question in, in terms of future planning, and, and Stephen made the point that this is a marathon, not a sprint. But uh, we had been expecting as a result of NDNA that there would be multi-year budgets, and that's not going to happen now. So how is that going to affect future planning? And just a, a quick one on top of that, how is Brexit going to affect the work of the High Street Task Force? Thanks. Well, Chair, I mean, I've, I've written both of those down, and um, uh, thanks for your welcome, um, uh, Mr. Sheehan. Um, in, in terms of multi-year budgets, um, it would be better if there was multi-annual budgeting. Um, uh, we would prefer fiscally as councils to work on an electoral term basis rather than a you know run to the line every March. But we don't have that. Certainly on our own mechanisms in terms of national lobbying of Treasury, this is something that we're asking for. In other words, for as much fiscal freedom of councils to look at the long term. But we have got what we've got, uh, if you'll excuse that, that, that phrase, in terms of um, uh, planning finance. I mean, my colleagues, both Alderman Mutri and indeed 
um, uh, Suzanne um, may wish to amplify that point. Um, I, I am tempted to also just very quickly respond, Mr Sheehan, to the point on, on EU exit. We are completing a barriers and opportunities uh, report with a public service excellence body across the water, and we'll be looking at that in, in great detail. But I think, like so many things, uh, EU exit and our removal of this uh, COVID situation, um, there are as many uncertainties there. But you know what? The high streets need communities. Communities need high streets. And whatever the wider environment, we've got to get our sleeves rolled up and passionately deliver reformed high streets. My colleagues may wish to amplify through yourself, Chair. Okay, thanks, Derek. Yeah, if I can um, come in as well, um, hi, Pat. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, multi-year budgeting um, would be a real ad um, advantage. But you know what? We've, we've got through um, with investment um, uh, so far um, across um, this region and uh, on annual budgets, we can continue to, to do that. It won't be as impactful, but certainly the bigger challenge for me at the minute is making sure that investment is prioritised um, for you know, revitalising our towns and our, and our cities and our village, villages. Um, and it's seen as absolutely, um, you know, I, totally important to recovery, essential for recovery, essential for bringing back tourists, essential for, for creating new jobs, um, et cetera, essential for, for socialising for communities as well, um, and mixing of communities um, within those places. That's where we should have um, the centre of our social life and the centre of our, our commerce um, too. And remember that councils can co-invest as well, and councils can um, look at longer term financing strategies as well um, through their, their borrowing powers too. So I think um, through a proper partnership, um, we can um, have impact and look to the longer term, but hopefully someday we will get multi-annual budgeting. I think that's really important for us. In terms of, of Brexit, um, clearly um, we, you know, we, we all um, are currently going through the issues um, with the trade deal at the minute and, and um, uh, trying to, to find a way to solve those so we can get um, the goods to our retailers and supply chains, etc. Um, and uh, but also um, looking at what competitive advantage we can have um, as a region too, um, and how we bring in more investment um, as a result of that. I think it's quite important we do that too. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, was there any other member that wanted to seek clarification at this stage or? Uh, on any issue, or we can we can draw you back into the conversation at the end. Maybe if, if members are happy enough there, then uh, what we could do is we could ask for uh, Neil Hutchison, the head of policy uh, from the Federation of Small Businesses, to be brought up uh, into the spotlight. And maybe if I could just appeal to uh, the communications team as well. Uh, I've managed to get my laptop working, so I may transfer at some stage onto. Uh, my laptop. So if you see me appearing again uh, in the audience, don't be too confused about that. And if you move me up, I'll switch my iPad off and then I'll have more functionality for the meeting. So um, if we could pass over to Neil then to give us a presentation. Good, good afternoon, uh, Chair, members and Assembly staff. Thank you for the invitation uh, on behalf of FSB members today. Um, I'll keep the scope of this quite, quite tight and then certainly invite uh, questions afterwards, uh, as we've just seen. So FSB is around 6,000 members in NI, many of whom, of course, would be in the sort of retail hospitality sector, i.e. Uh, on the high street. But there's also many others who would sit within uh, the wider high street ecosystem and therefore form uh, an integral part of it, whether they're actually sort of consciously aware of that or not. For example, those in a wider supply chain uh, and advice-based uh, organizations uh, or, or businesses. So for FSB, in, in this respect, we always try to remember it's about people in whatever way um, they interact with this ecosystem. Um, people as business owners, people that work for a business, people that visit a, a business, people that live in the place, uh, people who visit for longer, uh, or indeed, of course, those who might even have a, a consistency office there. It, it always comes back uh, to people. So members of the committee will be aware that the uh, executive office statement by uh, junior ministers last Thursday, uh, the 24th of February, um, was published at uh, the task force uh, having met for the first time a, a day earlier. 
Uh, and this included a, a statement sort of reiterating the need um, of the task force, which everyone here will, will, will be aware of, the high level terms of reference uh, and the membership of the task force itself. Members will also, of course, uh, know that there have been calls for a, a task force for some time, and it's, it's great that things are now uh, up and running. Uh, FSB, in this respect, is really pleased to be a member, uh, and there are positive signs. It's clear that uh, the joint chairs and secretariat wish to move swiftly. Uh, and even though, as, as referenced by our previous uh, speakers, the, the scale of the task is enormous and in many ways long term, uh, there does appear to be both an appetite and, and certainly the mechanisms that will allow us to co-design uh, interventions, interventions sorry, at, at pace where required and, and given, of course, the, the current uh, context. So the task force uh, secretariat have clearly carried out thorough engagement with other task force groups across uh, other nations. Uh, FSB uh, also benefits from having teams across England, Scotland uh, and Wales. Uh, we really hope to draw on and feed in those lessons from our colleagues uh, and to be positive, proactive members of the task force. And as members of the committee um, will also know, we feel that the task force members actually have a real responsibility to sort of stick within the scope uh, of the point at hand to, to do our homework uh, and to really help the secretariat to extract maximum value uh, out of the process itself. We feel that this point is actually all, often overlooked and can be a downfall of, of, of certain groups that come together. Uh, and indeed, uh, FSB being a, a member-led organization in our own right, we also actually have our own FSB uh, high streets group. Uh, and that's a mix of women and men running businesses in various sectors across different geographic areas uh, and, and noting the sort of rural urban divide, but all clearly linked to the ecosystem in some form. So following the, the first meeting of the task force last week, we, we met with our high streets um, group uh, on Friday to discuss the executive office statement and just to really take soundings. Members had a number of positive uh, recommendations, as you would expect, uh, and one of which firmly sits within the scope of this session today. So as others have said before, businesses just really thrive when policy is done with them rather than to them. Uh, and the task force chairs have clearly noted the aim to ensure co-design is at the heart of uh, the work program. But having examined the membership list, there was something that really came to the fore, a strong feeling from FSB members that more actual business owners uh, should form a part of the task force. And of course, uh, not taking anything away from the business owner there at present or indeed uh, other representatives, uh, myself included. But, but members felt that considering the four work streams that Suzanne just alluded to, it's likely that three of the subgroups would not actually have a, a business owner there. Um, and so subgroups are where um, most uh, or much of the more detailed work will take place. And so it seems reasonable on that basis that an additional three business owners could be added to the task for, force membership uh, on that basis. What this would do, would, would um, it would help ensure there's an additional checking mechanism. Um, any sort of geographical concerns are mitigated. And crucially, that uh, we actually ensure more female business owners are able to partake and this uh, is also a, a point that's often overlooked. But that all said, uh, we will follow the due process and make this suggestion at the next meeting to see if other members uh, agree with it. So to briefly recap then from an F FSB perspective, uh, we feel that we should really remember that this is about people in the various ways they interact with the high streets ecosystem. Uh, task force members have a real duty to engage within the scope to, to do our homework and ensure the secretariat can extract maximum value of the process. And then following discussions uh, with our members, F FSB will be proposing that we add three more additional um, business owners to the task force membership with a focus on female business owners while obviously noting the geographical uh, spread. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. I uh, appreciate that there. We will bring um, maybe the members back up into the, the spotlight again to see if there are any questions. But I suppose given th that there are so many other sectors that are involved in the High Street Task Force, I think actually it's a really valid point that you make that it's there to try and in one respect to help businesses survive so their voice is critical and um, do you find that they are that businesses in general are, are currently up for that sort of transformation that may be required in the high street that where it's kind of uh, historically been retail focused that that may not be the, the shape of um the high street in the future do, do you find the businesses that are there at the minute are saying yeah we we, we, we take that and we're up for any changes that there needs to be yeah, um, I suppose there's a couple of points there. The first is that 
we're never we're always sort of blown away by the the entrepreneurial spirit. It sounds obvious of business owners, but it's just amazing their ability to survive and think in a different way to, to people like myself. So we get around the table and suddenly all these ideas come at you and you think, yeah, I remember now why I actually talk to the members, you know, and it sounds so obvious, but there's just no substitute for it. They pick up on things uh, much more quickly than than I or, or my colleagues could so much of the time because this is their bread and butter. Um, what we have seen within, in, in obviously the, the, the COVID period is um, that ingenuity and, and people coming up with ideas. It's just something naturally that business owners do. So when you say, are you up for the change and you want to embrace that? Obviously it depends on the type of business, how well you're doing, how long you've been there. Um, but the, the members that we met on Friday, every single one of them uh, were really, really pleased that this group is up and running, um, sort of chomping at the bit to feed in uh, and, um, even though some of them don't realize that they are part of the high street, uh, very keen to contribute. Okay, thank you for that. Martina Anderson, is anybody getting there for maybe a question at this at this point? Are you there, Martina? I am, Chair. Um, thank you. And I suppose just to pick up on the comments that was made around the comprehensive spending review, because we all want more than um, a flat budget and a one-year budget, and I can appreciate and the fuse of Nilgan Ollers and like yourselves, I suppose we have got what we've got uh, at the executive level and assembly level, uh, unfortunately, because that's what was given. I want to reference the um, city deal and inclusive growth uh, in the context of the High Street Task Force, because I think the, the model in Derry is very much an example. When you look at Straban City uh, Centre, that's going to be regenerated, and then the Foil Key in Derry and plus other um, infrastructure developments that's taken place. So, Neil, when you talked about the importance of co-design, it was something that we were acutely aware about when we were doing that process in Derry, nothing about you without you. So you have to consult and you have to have the experience of the, the lived experience of those people. We raised this before, some of us, um, because when we got the composition of the task force in front of us, um, I was somewhat alarmed to see that there was nobody on it from Derry. And I'm glad to see what you're talking about, the geographical spread, because you cannot have um, businesses represented by the main business and all coming from Belfast. And I have said this before, and I, and I will keep saying this, unless it is going to be representative of, uh, of across the north, uh, then that's going to be crucially important. Could you give us a sense of how often you meet and how will decisions be taken? How will that engagement uh, when you talk about co-design from your end even, how, how will that take place? And I absolutely concur with the few that you're saying it needs to also not happen to you, that you need to be involved uh, in the process. Um, so if you could give me a wee understanding of all of that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, can I just clarify, first of all, do you mean uh, how often the task force will meet or is it the FSB group of members you're referring to? How often the task force will meet, okay. and then in terms of the compositional change, did you talk about the task force and um, making sure I'm keen to ensure that there's somebody in that task force from Derry? Yeah. Okay. So I believe in an answer one of the three. Um, the, the first is that the, the task force um, subgroups are, are due to be hopefully signed off, uh, we understand, in the coming weeks. And initially, um, we believe the task force should meet um, a little bit more regularly, perhaps once a month. Uh, and after that, it may go to a, a quarterly sort of pattern, the subgroups meeting uh, in between that. That's as much as, as, as we know. Uh, in terms of the co-design process uh, and everything else, uh, really good soundings um, last week uh, from the joint chairs and secretariat, but I have no further detail on that at the moment. Can I ask, Chair, in relation to the, um, the task force involvement in the transition to a green economy? Do you know um, if the task force will be engaged with uh, the experts within this field and uh, will be engaged with just to ensure that sustainability is at the heart of this, uh, particularly in the context of the, um, the High Street Task Force uh, and all the cities across the north? And I'm wondering if you have, there's this detail you haven't really touched upon yet. I'm quite keen to hear about parklets uh, that we know they're quite uh, popular and how that could uh, transform perhaps uh, the, the, the cities and the towns and if that's something that you would be keen to at least be involved in the kind of conversations that are taking place around all of those. Yeah, 
Um, so one of the, the key outcomes or indicators, I believe, in the terms of reference is, is around sustainability and green growth. So it's, it's yes to that. Again, because we only had the first meeting, um, very limited knowledge of how that will interact, but I've no doubt it'll be key in the agenda. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, look, I think we've, we've used up our sort of five minutes there um, with Neil, so we can hold on to you, Neil, until the end if there's any more uh, general points that people want to raise. Could I ask maybe now if uh, comms could um, uh, bring Colin Neil um, up into the spotlight and maybe if it suits the comms as well, just to leave the members in the spotlight, I think that would work work okay for us if it works at your end. But if we can welcome Colin Neil, the Chief Executive Officer uh, of Hospitality Ulster. Uh, Colin, you're very welcome. Um, if you want to, to kick off and give us um, a few minutes of an introduction and then we'll open it out for a question or two. Thank you, Chair and members, for the opportunity to, to, to actually engage. Uh, can I say it, it's in the length of time I've been speaking is more engagement we've had than around the, the actual roadmap from the the executive, which is a, a different story. Um, I'll do very briefly, Chair, and say I don't mind sp sharing the spotlight with everybody else. <laughs> I mean, for those that don't know, know it's Hospitality Ulster, membership body for the hospitality industry. Our membership consists of pubs, bars, um, restaurants, coffee shops, accommodation providers, and indeed major tourism, visitor attractions, and there are two airports. But a huge part of our industry is in the high street. And I use that term lightly because that's in our villages, our towns, and our cities where in every part of the country, uh, if you go down a country road, you'll find, you know, man you'll find manufacturing a shop and hospitality. Uh, it's actually the backbone of our, our economy. Hospitality industry in Northern Ireland is actually the fourth largest private sector employer in the province. Sustains 72,000 jobs, 4,000 businesses. It actually buys one third of Northern Ireland aggregate food production. Accounts for two thirds of our, our visitor spend. And as changes and we see around the world, hospitality and leisure are going to be a key part of the future of our, our high streets. Um, there will always be a place for retail, but we're going to see retail change and hospitality are going to be the people that take that up uh, and fill that role and also create that destination place. I mean, our, our, our high streets have to have social cohesion. You know, we're a place to meet, a place to, a place to, to, to greet and a place to, to interact. Um, we welcome the, the task force and indeed as a a previous town centre manager for years and also a, a head of, of, of economic development of local authority, you know, hugely connected uh, to our service centres in my previous life. Um, I suppose, I mean, you know, when you look at uh, the structures, I haven't had a chance to feed back yet um, to the High Street Task Force because there's only have one, uh, one meeting. So uh, forgive me if I'm telling you something I'm willing to tell them at the next meeting. I uh, say, really welcome it, but I have huge concerns about the structures, the way it's set up. We have a board of 30 plus people already. Um, I was on the reference group previously, and the suggestion was that the, the, the board should be made up of people with skills and knowledge, not representatives, because when you switch to representatives, you get into that point of, you need representatives from every geographical point. You need representatives from every type of person that uses the high street. And where do you stop? Um, on a 30-strong board, I, I am sure you know from engagement, trying to get decisions there uh, will be difficult. Also, the subgroups, again, were done to us. We had no choice or input in the subgroups. We were just told these are what the subgroups are going to be. Again, if this uh, organization, the task force, is going to actually have a say. It should actually, you know, one, have a governing board, and two, decide what the actual subgroups are, not just be told uh, what they're going to, to be done to us. Um, and, and I think, you know, it, it. I suppose where I am too in the end, I think the problem is if you compare ourselves to, like, the GB task force, it's a board of less than 10 people with 150 advisors. 
that allows you to tap in and do stuff. But can I, I think that the task force is going to have to be radical. It just can't be more of the same. It needs to provide leadership and advocacy. It, it needs to be in, involved in the COVID recovery as well, which is not, it, it can't sit there waiting. Um, this needs to be, you know, it needs to be action driven. Um, we've all been involved in lots of well-meaning talking shops. Uh, and I'm sure like the members of the committee, I, I totally respect well-meaning talking shops, but we all don't have time for this. The clock is ticking for, for our high streets. Uh, so I'm trying it must be act, action driven. And also too, I think it has to be a vehicle to help and empower local authorities. Um, you know, and working closely with them to actually make sure they're able to move ahead sometimes over the executive and to move on their own and to help them get the funding they need. This has to be a partnership. It can't just be a consultative road, uh, role to the, to, to the executive, you know, and, and that's it. Um, otherwise, look, uh, we'd be better doing something else. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate that. Now, as ever, your honesty there in issues. I'm going to bring in a moment, uh, Trevor, and but just two quick questions to, to clarify. Did you say that the GB model had like 10 members and then loads and loads of advisors and that we're at 30 members here? Is that? They, they have a board of, I think it's 10 or 11, it's below 12, but they have probably like 150 advisors. Right. Okay. More. Okay. Okay. Our current model, if you take it, private sector is outnumbered by government officials. Um, I think some are about two to one. Okay. Therefore, okay. it'll be what the government officials decide. It won't be what we, yeah. we want. And the other issue is that we've been told that as part of the COVID recovery plan, I mean, I specifically asked the, the First Minister uh, during question time that the High Street Task Force really needed to sit um sort of somewhat separate to the COVID recovery, but there would be areas where they would cut across and join because the high street was declining before COVID and then COVID, you know, hopefully you know, will disappear quickly uh, going forward and then we will still have the same decline that there was in the high street. So uh, it, there's no point in doing high street recovery without COVID recovery and there's no point in doing COVID recovery without the other. Are, are you saying that there's been little interaction between those two strands to date? Well, I mean, again, we've only had one meeting of the 30 strong board, and that was more going around being told what the, the, the committees were and what the terms of reference uh, and who were members. Okay. Uh, look, if it's not going to meet, you know, it, it's not going to meet every month. It's going to be the subgroups. The subgroups, as you've seen, I don't see how they're dealing with COVID. Uh, in the world we're in, for us, I'd be looking to engage every week. Um, things are, are moving fast. Uh, and I say not to potentially beat the drum, but like, you know, the, the recovery plan um, would have been much better with discussions and, and input before it was launched. And I appreciate, look, it's, it's working with a five-party coalition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, feedback will say, oh, well, we have to get agreement of the five-party coalition first. But is it, it would it not be much better to have the stakeholders involved, not to tell government what to do or have the control, but to... Explain what the, the 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 all intended consequences of actions would be, and suggest things that can be done. Because what you end up with is, as we've got, here's a roadmap, and all the all the, the trade bodies are in lobbying against it, or or depending on their tech, rather than bought in in that partnership. Okay, okay, valid points. Um, Trevor Lund, you're looking in there if you want to come in. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Hello, Colin. The other Colin, sorry, it's good to see you again. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear you're being so forthright about the size and structure of this new body because I always find these bodies start off small and then expand until they're far too big. This one seems to be starting off far too big. So we'll see where it goes, but, you know, have to work with it. I just want to ask you a specific question, Colin, about the, the best use of money when the money starts to come through. Where do you think a business improvement districts would fit in the overall scenario? Do you think in, is that money well spent or is it a waste of money? Well, business improvement districts have a really valuable role. And if you like, say, back in my day, I back in the day was a town centre manager. And indeed, I actually brought in the first voluntary business improvement district in the Balamine area uh, yeah. in that model. 
I think again, it's like everything, it's provided it's a good one. There are good ones and bad ones. Um, yeah. and, I mean, also too, when you have them joining, you know, touching boundaries, uh, there's a challenge there to get them to work collectively and not compete uh, in areas. But I think there is a role for them. Um, obviously, the businesses in the area have the vote and the voice. Now, sometimes that can be tapered with the fact that if, if your bid's in an area where there's lo local, lots of local government buildings and they have a big rateable value, well, they can be told to vote in a certain way, you know. But yeah. I, think, I think in the round, they are good and have an important role to play. Do you think, Colin, that in present circumstances and the straight and terrible times we're in at the moment, that uh, businesses would be prepared to stump up their contribution as it might have been in the past? I think it's more, it's not so much being prepared as if they can afford to. I mean, okay. the time they, I mean, you look at the hospitality sector, uh, the Office of National Statistics, which is not me making up stuff, it's the UK government's own national statistics body, says two fifths of our businesses don't have enough cash to get them to the end of May. Um, they won't have enough cash to open. And indeed, there's debt right down the supply line. So if you look at the front end, and I have membership in the, we have members in our food service supply and beverage supply line as well, so we can see it. If you, if you look at our retail end opening, they don't have the money to pay the debt that they owe from previous openings. So they're on cash only and have no cash. The suppliers don't have the money to pay the producers because they're owed. So we're going to need an injection of cash right down the system. So asking for, you know, particularly if it's large amounts, um, you know, hospitality works on an awfully tight margin. Um, there are, when we open, we're, we are not like non-essential retail. Non-essential retail, when it opens, and I, and I appreciate they have suffered, but they open with, you know, hand sanitizing and masks. We open with numbers severely reduced indeed. Uh, when you model social distancing and all, we're maybe working at 12.5% of occupancy. So our margins aren't there even to make a sustainable financial level. It's not even a profit. So the challenge will be do they have the money uh, to pay it? Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, look, Colin, thank you very much for that. A couple of very key points in there that I think we need to be following up. And uh, we appreciate that answering Trevor's question. Um, Maybe if we could ask for Aidan Connolly to be brought up, uh, Director of the Northern Ireland Retail uh, Consortium. Um, maybe if we could just get some views from yourself, uh, Aidan, on the High Street Task Force, please. Uh, yeah, I think as far as a bit of uh, background, it's always very hard to go after Colin. He covers everything. Um, if, uh, thanks for the opportunity. It's, it's great to see you all again. As far as background, High Street was changing long before COVID. Um, there had been more change in the five years previous to COVID than in the previous 50, and then we've changed uh, since. Um, and, and all COVID has done is accelerate um, those changes. So, for example, there are some retailers doing deliveries, online stuff now that they thought they would be doing in eight or ten years uh, from now. This this that we're having about the, how this, uh, the, the high street looks in the 21st century, something I've actually been working on for almost 10 years um, when we published our 21st century high streets uh, paper. We wanted to have a strong vision of where we want to be. And that is something that the high street uh, task force managed to do, is managed to bring a lot of people together, a lot of enthusiastic people, a lot of knowledgeable people, but it's still a lot um, I think what Colin said there about retail going to contract, we've been saying that for 10 years. Retail is going to contract quite simply because of how people engage with the retail industry, of how we use our space. Now, the big question is what happens then? And, and for us, there's a real need to look at our towns and cities and villages as destinations. There's a big, big, big principle in this. How do you get people to spend their time, not just their money? And that is a, a big difference in spending their money, a big, big difference. Now, what needs to happen with that high street is we need to have more hospitality. We need to have more leisure. We don't have very much leisure in any of the high streets. Um, we also need to look at living over the shops and living in town. There's something that we have not historically done or been able to do here in, in, in Northern Ireland. 
And if you look at places, even if you look at places like Falkirk, where they have done a lot of work on that, it, it, provide, it provides new communities, but that also needs infrastructure, that needs capital grants for changing of land usage. It also needs things, pools, health centres, uh, and, and green space as well. Like, this is a big ask. And that's one of the reasons why we are putting faith within the the the, the, the Heritage Task Force because one of the things we're particularly bad at doing here in Northern Ireland is long-term planning. We will plan for an election cycle. We will plan for five years. We will do yearly budgets where we need to with this. And we're, what we've been saying for many years now is we need to plan for 10, 20 and 30 years. And again, it's about that destination. How do we make our high street somewhere where people uh, want to work, where somewhere want, people want to spend time and where people uh, want to live. I completely take the point um, that Martina was making earlier on about this This needs to be across the, the north. And while I live uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Belfast, uh, I am originally west of the barn. And, and if it was a normal year, I would be uh, north, south, east and west in, in Northern Ireland uh, every week. But that actually brings a really important point and, and something that can't be lost uh, within the task force and that's every northern ireland has its own particular flavor its own particular strengths and we cannot um we cannot look at this as a one shoe fits so if you look at you know th there's already strides that have been made so for example darren council what they've done with halloween that that's a huge selling point, but they need to look at how to widen that out over the whole year. Newry, they have a wonderful canal structure down their big town hall. Why is that not being used as a uh, cafe culture? You know, for the for the summer period, pedestrianisation. Bangor has is huge potential as far as it's got, already got leisure. It's one of the few places that has leisure. It has good hospitality, great uh, great restaurants and, and and pubs there. But we need to get um, people to come back to that high street rather than going out. And then uh, Armagh with this Georgian heritage. So there are plenty of examples of potential. What we need to do is turn that potential into a working marketable uh, solution and, and plan that works not only for the people who visit, but for the people who, who live there. The other thing that we need to do is that we need to look at places outside of this island and outside of these islands. We need to learn places like Berlin, Aarhus, uh, Gothenburg, Lille, where they have actually done this regeneration, and their regeneration has been about people uh, as much it has as it has been about place. There's lots of places where regeneration has worked, and then it's become cyclical. And we've seen that in Belfast city centre, where we had Castle Court, and then the next one we had uh, Victoria Square, and now we're waiting where the next one is going to be. Where what we won't don't what we should be doing is looking at how we bring and keep people up together rather than one goes up and on, on, on one goes down. And, and finishing off, um, there is a, a need for leadership, there's a need for advocacy, but most of all, there's a need for delivery. And it is the, it is a group. Um, and, and we remain to be seeing what, what the delivery will be. I think we do have um, some good people uh, leading it, but we need some short term we need some medium term and we need some long term objectives and we need some uh, uh, immediate uh, deliverables there are two things that we need to come from the task force there's those deliverables which have a tangible effect and that can be used by local councils that can be used by by uh, the bids that have been talked about that to actually make a difference but the thing and, and perhaps just as important is that we need to explain to the executive and explain to the departments that the decisions they make do not happen in a vacuum. And for us to be able to do that and show how the decisions will actually affect high streets across Northern Ireland is, is going to be uh, hugely important. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks Thanks very much um, for that, Aidan. Um, before I look to see if any members have indicated to come in there, um, I, I suppose, you know, you raise a valid point. It's something I, I don't think there's an answer to this, but it's maybe just a, a problem that there there often is. And I sometimes have noticed within my area that as soon as something opens up of whatever type of product uh, a product that has been sold or type of shop it is, it seems that suddenly you see three of them, and then all of a sudden all three can't survive, and the three have to close. 
and it's kind of is there is there any way that that people can help to shape areas that the businesses that do open are given that chance to survive because it's almost like as soon as somebody has a good idea three others come out and try and do it and then you know especially as as people have referenced that this high street task force is as much about villages and small towns uh, as it is the big cities but uh, how do you manage a problem like that it depends how you look around the world. So uh, some countries, especially the Nordic countries, have impact assessments that are done in the same way as we would do retail impact assessments or economic impact assessments for those large planning uh, uh, um, uh, decisions. Um, they're, they're, and even in, in, in the United States, they have it in, in a, on, a, on a state and on a, a local city level as far as um, the, the zoning. So you have a hospitality zone or a, a certain amount of hospitality within each. That, that's hard to do on, on a village setting. Um, but then, you know, one of the things that we saw after the 2007, 2008 recession was that you suddenly had loads of coffee shops and loads of charity shops. And that actually, you know, it helped uh, in the short term. It is not a long term answer, though, to what uh, the high street needs. I'll go back to the point that retail is contracting and will continue to contract. We need that vision, and that vision needs to be set out for each town, village, and, and whatever. It needs to be tailored to what they need. And then if it is that they're going to promote uh, living over the shops and, and that town centre living, then they need to set out space for green space. They need to set out space for, I mean, these doctor's practices, schools, and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but this, what it should be is a decision uh, at a local uh, enough level uh, to um, allow them to 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 not lose the flavour of the town and not let, let it become a clone. But at the same time, that's going to need local councils uh, to have those regeneration powers to do what is needed for, for those local areas. Okay, thank you for that, Aidan. Um, okay, I think if we're happy enough on this, there's any other member that has a question there, we can move on then and thank Aidan for that and ask John McGrillan um, to be brought up into the... Uh, uh, the spotlight, John McGill, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Tourism NI. And um, maybe just before John comes in, can I just say, Trevor, Lon, you still have your hand up there. So, if are you looking, were you looking to ask a question there, were you, or was it still up well, from the last time? I didn't know I had my hand up still, but I'd like to ask John a question in a few minutes. Okay, right. okay we'll leave your hand up. <laughs> I know it's there then. Perfect. Okay, twice. so. John, um, you're very welcome. Uh, if you would like to go on ahead there and give us a few minutes introduction. So John is, I can see John is in the spotlight. Yeah. We've got John with us now, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can indeed, John. Yes, good, oh, good yeah. to hear you. Go, go on ahead. Sorry, right, Colin. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for the, for the invite to come and uh, contribute this, this afternoon. Uh, we are interested in this from a couple of perspectives. Firstly, as Chief Executive of Tourism and I, obviously, but um, I've also spent 16 years in local government, uh, five of those as Director of Development at Belfast City Council. And, and like yourself, I'm a relic of the old Down District Council of, of a few years ago. Uh, but I suppose from my perspective, the, the vibrancy of, of cities, towns and village centres are really incredible, incredibly important to the from a tourism point of view. Um, and similarly, I believe that tourism makes a really significant contribution and can do to the future health of towns and cities. And Colin made a point earlier about the importance of the hospitality sector mm. to town and city centres. Tourism, all those figures that, talked to, to, that Colin made reference to, tourists spend £1 billion worth of that money and £750 million of that money that was spent in those towns uh, town and city uh, hospitality establishments in, in 2019 came from outside of Northern Ireland. So that's a very significant mm -hmm. uh, sum of money which is being brought in to the region and, and is getting spent here. Um, and about 40% of that was spent in Belfast, principally in the city centre, uh, with the remainder of that being spent in towns and villages across the whole, whole of Northern Ireland. Um, and you know, Ian made the point there uh, quite correctly that retail has been in a sort of in a downward journey for for a significant period of time, and that's been accelerated by COVID. And I, mean, I think COVID has a different impact on the tourism sector. I mean, what we've seen is a shock, uh, but all of the research suggests that there's still a very significant you know, desire to travel you know, locally and internationally. Uh, and 
all of the research which has been done across the globe and by ourselves would suggest that the tourism industry can bounce back really quickly. So our expectation is that by you know, 2023, we will be back to about 80% of where we were in 2019. And by 2024, 25, back to being a one, you know, I think it's much more than one billion pound industry, but where tourists, i.e. people who are staying overnight in a location, will be spending, you know, one billion pounds in those places where they stay. Um, so all of the indications are that as we move forward, you know, people are going to be more likely to visit smaller walkable cities rather than large metropolises. You know, people don't want to be where places are crowded, you know, so we're less likely to see people want to go to places like Venice and Barcelona, and we're more likely to see people want to go to smaller cities that are walkable, that are green, and health and well-being is going to be a real big factor for people, you know, when they go on holiday in the future. So again, more likely to stay in rural towns and villages. And I think given the landscape that we've got, given the selection of towns and villages and cities and the very different natures of them, you know, I think we're very well placed, you know, to, to uh, I suppose, maximise the opportunity that the global tourist industry uh, can, can deliver. So in my view, tourism and the tourists can play a significant role in contributing to the vibrancy of the town centres as, as we go forward. And you know, I would agree very much with you know what, what Ian has just said there about the importance about the individual individuality of each of these places and each of them being a destination. You know, people do want to come, and when they come here, you know, they, they want to have authentic experiences, they want to engage with local people, they want to understand the local history of the place that they're in, and they want to hear the stories that are being told. Um, and every tourism authority in the world now is looking towards, you know building back tourism in a, in a regenerative way. So what, what does that mean? It means being less focused on, on visitor numbers um, and being much more focused on job creation, enhancing and improving the built and natural environment and, and supporting sustainable communities in those places. So there really is a symbiotic relationship, I think, between the tourists helping to sustain attractive town centres and, and bringing the benefits. But for that to happen and to get tourists there, you know, the town, city, centre and village, villages have got to be attractive in their own right. You know, so we, we need to look at how these things, you know, collectively work together. If, if we look at the people who come to Northern Ireland as visitors, 70% mm. of them come here to explore our culture and our heritage. And they want to explore those authentic experiences and they want to engage with local people, as I said, and they want to enjoy local food and local drink. So I think what we need to do here, again, as Ian had said, we need to look at those individual places, look at their strengths, and look to see how we you know, build upon those and make them attractive to the tourists as they come come forward. Um, and undoubtedly, you know, people are going to want to see city centres, town centres that are much greener, uh, they're cleaner, that have a you know a really sort of strong local hospitality offer you know, that's got a vibrant nighttime economy. People want to come and they want to stay in places that are vibrant, with good restaurants to go out, where they can go and have a beer, where they engage with local people. So they have to be great places to stay. And if we want to make sure that when people come up here, they just don't come to Belfast and you know head off back to Dublin, you know, we want to make sure that we have got places that have got that vibrancy and have got vibrant nighttime economies to make sure that we can get people to stay and spend their money and contribute to you know the economic well-being of those of those local areas. As I said, you know, they're very keen to explore our culture and our heritage. I think one of the things that we need to do is we need to give much more support to our, our cultural venues, uh, make sure we've got good programming, make sure we've got great events, make sure that we've got marketplaces for people to visit. And I think sometimes we underinvest in those things. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly if one looks at the investment that goes in to you know, the cultural sector here in comparison to other places, it's much less. And there's been a huge divestment in support for a lot of our cultural and built heritage assets over the last number of years. And I think we need to we need to look at that. Um, in terms of retail, you know, the tourist is interested in, they don't want to see every high street looking the same. They're really keen to see independent retailers who are, you know, selling local produce. Um, as, as Ian had said, they want the town to look distinctive. Um, and our town should not be cloned. I mean, I think we've spent too much time in the past with re regeneration projects and town centres and every town has got the same street lighting, it's got the same furniture, it's got the same, you know, paving. You know, we need to make our places look distinctive and they need to be rooted in the heritage and the history of the place and the people who, who live within it. Um, and I think we need to cluster services in a way that they're, they're self-sustaining. 
and can work collectively together. You know, the tourism is, is you know, you, you can't go out and do your own thing in the tourism industry. You know, if you're a hotel in a town, you're dependent upon the restaurants, you're dependent upon the visitor attractions. Everybody needs to cluster together, work together, and work for their collective, you know, a, a, a mutual benefit. So I suppose, you know, in, in, in my view, uh, we have got a significant role to play. I would also agree very strongly with Aidan around what he said. There are other places who have done this really, really well, and, and we don't have to, you know, reinvent the wheel. And I think Detroit, you know, was an example he didn't mention, but I mean, Detroit was on its knees 10 years ago. It has completely reinvented itself as a city, a city centre that is built on, you know, its culture and its heritage um, and, and developed a tourism product of what was a very much an industrialised city. Um, again, Colin made the point about talent, and we need to get the very best people to help us with this process. I mean, when I was, when I was in Belfast City Council as Regeneration Director, myself and Peter McNally, who's the Chief Executive, we went to Manchester and said, you have done this really well. How do we go about doing this? And they said, don't ask us. You go to, go to, go to, go to um, set us off to Toronto and said, you know, if you want to find somebody who's going to really help in terms of helping you define what you want to do. So I think we need to get the really best talent to support us in doing this. I think there's some really useful things that are happening that we can lean upon and build upon. Martina mentioned city deals, you know, and, and there are a number of very significant tourism and regeneration projects there, which I think will have a really positive impact in town centres, you know, including Belfast and Derry and other, other places as well. And we've got some really good examples close to home here where we have done that well. If we look at you know, Newcastle, that you will be familiar with, if we look at what's happened in Cathedral Quarter, I think Titanic Quarter is a fantastic example of a tourism and energy generation project where a big investment that went into Titanic Belfast has really driven the growth of you know all the other sectors that are now starting to thrive down there. So I mean I I do think that there are examples that we, we would uh, look towards the other thing I would say um mention is I mean there was a regional development strategy drawn up it must be close to 20 years ago, which sort of would you know set out the um, let's say the hierarchy of place within Northern Ireland, and it was you know it was developed in in, in the times that were then. Um, things have changed dramatically since that point, and I think you know coming back again to the point that he had made about the distinctiveness of place. Places cannot be the same; they can't perform the same functions. Mm -hmm. Tourists won't go to every town; they will go to some. Inward investment won't go to every town; they will go to some. I think that regional development strategy, you know. I'm not even sure if people are even familiar with the fact that it still exists, you know. But I do think that that needs to be needs to be revisited, um, you know, in, in terms of how we start to restructure the region. Um, I've I've heard the comments. I think they're valid enough around the numbers of people who are on, you know, the the the, the task force. I do think that there should be a tourism representative, and I don't mean myself. I mean somebody from the industry. Um, who really understands it, who understands the dynamic of it and the benefits it can bring. And I think in terms of the vision, you know, it, the word visit doesn't, isn't reflected there. And I think, you know, places mm -hmm. need not only be a good place to live, and, you know, and a good place to do business, they should also be a good place to learn and a good place to visit. So, you know, I, I would like to see the vision of it all possible, reflecting the importance of the visit, because I think that will be much more important as we go forward. I do think that we need to use our town centres to provide that leisure provision, as, as, as Aidan has said, and start to look to so, see how we can meet the needs of the tourists of the future, encourage them to stay in our towns, spend their money, and contribute to sustainable communities and sustainable town centres moving forward. Okay, John, thank you very much. Thank you for, for that presentation, which um, went significantly uphill after you referred to me as a relic, uh, which I, I think I can allow you to say. Like you, to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, forgive that. Um, there's a couple of members I see that are looking to come in, but I, I know we had kind of spoken about this before, uh, but I think it's a really important point, which is that, um, you know, do you think that COVID will have had some sort of impact on, um, if I could say, the sort of the type of visitor that's going to be coming, that, that people may be less prepared to engage in overseas travels for two weeks or three weeks at a time, and, and that that may impact some uh, on that sort of American model, and that maybe we should be looking at sort of more local uh, tourism in the sort of England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. And, and that point that you made about 
you know, investing in culture and festivals and events, because that's something that people maybe will come back to and back to and back to, rather than that great big massive building that once you've been around it once, you're maybe not really going to come back to it again. Has COVID maybe going to have some impact there? I think, I mean, I think ultimately the impact of COVID will be, um, I mean, I think what the, what the tourists will be looking for in the future is going to be somewhat different. I think they're going to be much more focused on sustainability. I think they're much more, much more focused on health and well-being. They're probably going to be much more focused on, you know, that engagement with the, with the local community and, and that authentic experience. Um, and all of the trends were sort of heading in that direction before COVID. I mean, I think of anything, COVID has probably accelerated that, made people much more aware of those of those of those issues. Um, in terms of where people might come from, you know, certainly, you know, we will be looking at a close to home market first. Um, and 74% of our spend, you know, in, in 2019 came from, you know, um, the, the UK and Ireland. So um, okay. there is there is potential for growth beyond that. I mean, I wouldn't sort of say we'll not see the Americans or Europeans come back. I think we absolutely will. And I think there's the potential for the industry to grow. But I think our focus moving forward will not be about visitor numbers. It'll be about value. It'll be about spend. It'll be about what contribution does it make to communities? Because we shouldn't really be worried so much about the tourist that you know, what I mean tourism doesn't tourism doesn't form a purpose and it doesn't really make a positive contribution to the place to where those visitors come. Um, and I think you know what's happened in recent years in places like Venice and Barcelona have identified that. You know, when local residents started to feel that you know tourism was no longer benefiting them, there was a kickback. I think we're a long way from that. Um, but I do think our focus going forward needs to be how do we make tourism contribute, you know, to to these things, and not least contribute to the vibrancy and the sustainability of you know of our town centres and the built heritage um, and and the cultural assets that sit within them. Okay, thank thank you, John. John, I'm going to pass over to Trevor Lund, just who's looking to ask a question. Yes, uh, thanks, John, for all that, and I think you make a very valid point about the link between tourism and the vibrancy of town centres. It's perfectly obvious; one feeds off the other, and. Uh, I think also that our tourists offer here is, is the equal of anything in these islands, We're perhaps better even, and, and underused so far. But uh, the question I wanted to ask you was, in terms of bringing tourists in here, this perhaps isn't a task force question, but it's, it's, it's related. Um, are you satisfied with the efforts that, that are made, let's say, in the Republic to encourage all Ireland tourism and people to come up here as well as going to Dublin? And the same would apply to UK and Scotland. Um, I mean, our, 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 is that the question? Is the question get people from the Republic to come up here, or people who come onto the island of Ireland to travel around the island of Ireland? Uh, it's it's both, John. Uh, it's, it's the efforts made by my understood that tourism Ireland, tourism Northern Ireland were closely aligned. Uh, yes. so, and you said that sort of 74% of our visitors come from the Republic and the UK. But that, yes. that's, that, it's a very high figure, but it might not be a very high number. So, so are you satisfied with the cooperation? Well, I am. I mean, I, I, mean, I think we work, we work very closely and we work well with Tourism Ireland. I, mean, I, I think part of our challenge in terms of getting people from further afield into Northern Ireland is the fact that the connectivity in the very first instance is very much in Dublin. You know, we don't yeah. have any direct routes to, to North America. We have very few direct routes into Europe. You know, so if we're going to get those visitors, you know, it, it, it is working with people, you know, in the Republic to make sure that, you know, we we, we have Northern Ireland programmed as a, um, you know, as That's part of our overall offer. So we would very work, work very closely with the Incoming Tour Operators Association, for example. We are pretty much all ROI based, but they bring, a, you know, a very significant number of people across the border. Um, and, and I think part of our challenge is, is to make sure that the places we have are attractive places for them to stay overnight and then, you know, for, you know, to, for a coach to turn up, park up, and when they go out at night, there's something to do, somewhere to eat, a bar to go in, music to be heard. And we're a little bit limited, if I'm honest. You know, Belfast does do that, Derry to a lesser extent, but beyond Belfast and Derry, I think it's very hard to find places, you know, that, that meet those needs. And I think as we move forward with this exercise, I think there are certain towns that have got potential, not everyone, but towns that have got potential to be tourism hubs and 
you know, identify them as having that potential and build around that potential and use that as a means by which we encourage people to stay longer, you know, and spend more and contribute more and create more jobs. Okay, thank you. Okay, could I ask uh, Christopher Stalford um, if you, to ask your question, please? Hello there, John. Um, good to see you again. Um, I think we can all agree that you know all that you achieved when you were the director of Belfast Council was achieved because you had an excellent chairman of the development committee. I don't know who that fellow was again, but um, I just wanted to ask you. You mentioned about the development of town centres, and obviously coming from Belfast, this is something that. Um, is important to me. Um, I remember very clearly the waterfront hall first opened, and what was previously an old cattle yard basically became a, a positive feature in the city. And then over time, the area around the waterfront hall simply got overdeveloped to the point where Oxford Street, for example, is simply a mass of glass and steel. And I think that one of the things that Belfast needs frankly, like a hole in the head, is more glass and steel structures. And I think what happens is when buildings are built with a lifespan in mind, they become disposable. Whereas if buildings are built with a view to lasting forever, they actually become genuinely beautiful buildings. What role do you think the planning service has in ensuring the sensible development of town centres? And, I mean, Newcastle is actually a good example of where it has been it has been modernized and brought up to date, but it has worked in a, in a positive way. Whereas I can think of examples around the city of Belfast where frankly it hasn't worked. And I'm just wondering if you could talk to that in terms of the role that planning has in preserving the integrity of towns and city centers so that they don't simply become you know, carbon copies of everywhere. And you're in a city and you could be in any city in the world because everything just looks the same. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm the best person to comment on that, Christopher, given that I, I looked after the extension of the water from the hall, but um, <laughs> I, think, I think you make a very valid point. Um, and again, I mean, if I'm, if I'm speaking from a tourism perspective, the built heritage is incredibly important, you know, in terms of making the place attractive. If you, I mean, I always look at places like, I mean, if I think around uh, Lisbon and you go around Lisbon, it's very, very hard to find a new building in Lisbon. You know, they've taken old buildings and they've repurposed them, and they've repurposed them in a way, you know, even as for living accommodation, you know, which makes a place, you know, the, the attractiveness of the place remains, and you know, the vibrancy, uh, you know, comes with that, which makes it attractive. And, and you know, that you get yourself into virtual circle or a virtual circle that benefits benefits everybody. And I, mean, I, I think the planning is, is is critically important. I mean, I think. And this is just my own view, but I think the saddest thing is when you look back at some of the websites that you see now on Facebook and whatever, you know, old images of Belfast 100 years ago. In many ways, it was a much more attractive city 100 years ago than it is today. But I think what we need to do is protect the built environment that we currently have and, and, and repurpose that and reuse it in a positive way that makes it not just attractive to the tourists, but to the people who live there and the people who utilize the city centers. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Christopher, and thank you, John. I appreciate that that input and those answers. Um, we're, we're going to move on quickly because, as ever, we're we're running behind time. But uh, if we could ask uh, Glenn Roberts to be brought up into the um, spotlight from uh, the chief executive of Retail NI, uh, and we'll hand over to yourself, Glenn, to give us a few minutes of input, and then members wishing to ask questions will indicate, and I'll bring them in. Well. Chair, sure, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity. Um, and uh, maybe if I, I, I don't want to sort of cover a lot of the what my colleagues have uh, uh, already covered about the importance of 21st century town centres that are ecosystems of lots of different types of business that are green, that are very, very different to the model that we've had before. Uh, what I maybe want to try and sort of cover is where we see the task force going, uh, what it needs to do, um, and I think where it feeds into the wider recovery efforts. I think the first thing to say is that Retail and I has been calling for a high street task force for the best part of 10 years. In fact, this is something we were calling for a long time before the pandemic. 
And the reasons very simply was that responsibility for town centres and high streets is scattered across a, a number of different departments. And what we wanted to try and do is, is get the executive on the one page, coordinating things like rates, planning, regeneration, car parking, uh, infrastructure investment, to make sure all of those things are pushing in the one direction for a coherent plan uh, to create 21st century high street. So ultimately, what this task force and the task force role, even though it is early days yet, uh, is very much about the medium to long term uh, challenges facing our high streets. And that's right that we do have that long term thinking because quite often we can get sucked into assembly life cycles or programme or government life cycles. So it's important that we have some long-term thinking. Um, I was a, a member of the original reference group that set up the task force and very much what we were bringing and saying, look, this needs to be a partnership of executive departments and business and other civic groups. And so it enabled us to co-design solutions and what I was concerned about, that we would have a situation where the business groups would be shunted off in some sort of advisory bit and we would be sort of uh, summoned now and again to be told what is happening. But we're there in equal partnership and that's what it needs to be, a proper partnership in every sense of the word between key government departments, councils, business, trade unions and other players in civic society. So um, I was... Uh, I was uh, I, I was reasonably confident about the, the first official meeting of the task force. It's certainly a lot bigger than what we originally envisaged. But ultimately, it won't be judged on its membership. It will be judged on ultimately what it delivers. And that's what ultimately people will say. Um, you know, it's, and I hope that this is not another talking shop. And I hope that this is very much seen alongside the wider executive efforts to recover post-pandemic and indeed to create a very new vision for our economy as a whole. So I'm encouraged. I thought the first meeting went well. What I would say is that perhaps we have a more immediate uh, challenge. And originally the subgroups that we, the reference group that created the task force suggested there would be a COVID-19 recovery group within it or subgroup within it. Now that's been subbed off divided up to the COVID-19 recovery group, that's the, which the executive office is leading on. And there's where I think we have a difficulty. Um, if you read through, and obviously with most business groups, we weren't particularly impressed with the uh, pathway report that came out yesterday. But one thing amongst a lot of things that was missing is what actually happens in terms of coordinating the approach in getting our high streets ready for reopening. Assuming that we have uh, non-essential retail ready to go by, hopefully after Easter, why has there been no preparation in relation to things like COVID marshals, uh, public hand sanitizing units, COVID compliance signage, all of those vital things that are important, not just to create confidence for consumers as they return to our high streets, but also ensuring that the external elements in our high streets and our town centres are playing their role to reduce the levels of transmission of our virus. And we've suggested in uh, discussions with executive office officials this very morning that there needs to be a, a very short-term group set up that will coordinate with councils, with executive departments, to make sure that over these next few weeks and months, that our high streets, our town centres are ready for reopening. And I think that planning can begin now. Um, we don't need to wait to the 16th of March. The preparation for that can begin now so that we can hit the ground running. And I think the role of the executive in this is ensuring that there is a, uh, a framework that councils, business uh, and other organisations can play in relation that there are common standards across the 11 council areas. And one thing that I observed where we had the uh, reopening in December, is there was not uniformity or coordination or uh, across the council areas. So you had some council areas, town centres, that were better organised than others. So I think that there needs to be, that we need to have that in place. And that is, I mean, an immediate thing that needs to happen in a matter of days. Um, that needs to be set up now to make sure that we can hit the ground running. Uh, when hopefully the executive do give us the green light 
to reopen non-essential retail in the near future. But looking at the long term, uh, it will be tackling the age-old challenges of business rates. I mean, we have not, we haven't solved the issue of business rates just because we have a rates holiday, a very welcome rates holiday. We need fundamental restructuring of our business rate system. We need a tightening up of our planning system. There are still out of town retail developments that are getting through and being allowed through by the councils. So again, that's something the Minister of Infrastructure can look at. How do we make sure our rural towns are, are looked after? We suggested to infrastructure that we need a rural town infrastructure development fund. How do we develop the concept of localism? And that con concept of localism isn't just about supporting independent retailers. It's about changing the leadership model in our local high streets and our town centres. Uh, and we have suggested we have a localism on steroids. And let, um, maybe one last thing. There seems to be this sort of common narrative that the one thing we need less of in 21st century high streets is less retail. What we need is a different type of retail. We don't need any more big multiples. What we need is the next generation of independent retailers that really make a difference, add something different to our high streets, that will be the cutting edge of not just a new vision for our high streets, but also at the driving force and the cutting edge of a very different retail sector, which is more based with indigenous, local, family-owned companies that offer something different. But let me say this. I mean, you've heard a lot of jargon talked about high streets and what we've looked about, co-decision and all those wonderful jargon. Ultimately, what is the definition of success for our high street? It is something that is fun, family friendly, that people will want to come back time and time again. And if we can create that, we'll move forward. Thank you for your time. Thanks very much for that, Glenn. Appreciate that. Um, I have an indication here from Trevor Clark that he'd like to ask a question. Thank you, Chair, and uh, that's good to see you, Glenn. I'm not paying you, but I actually struck a chord whenever you were speaking, and after listening to all the other speakers, like yourself, obviously, we all went on task force, and I mean, and I, I fully accept that you were one of the ones, and I've heard you many times calling for that, and I think it is a good thing, whether COVID had happened or otherwise, it's certainly a good idea for Northern Ireland to try and get, uh, find a way forward in terms of trying to fix some of our failing streets. Now, this is not, don't take us in offence, but... I suppose I'm just wondering, because I've listened to what Colin had said yourself and others, but I suppose there's the perception that you will be in there actually just fighting for your membership and not necessarily what it is for the vision. And I suppose I'm saying that because Colin, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying to paraphrase what Colin said, and he didn't attack elected representatives, but he did talk about there is no point in having, you know, public representatives in that. And indeed, I actually agree with you at all in terms of the, um, uh, with loading up with officials either. I don't think there is a place for that. Well, on one hand, that's been said. On the other hand, I'm thinking, well, let, let's not have public representatives who represent an opinion, but let's have representative bodies who are going to represent the view of their membership, paid membership. You know what I mean? So what, do you see a conflict there, Glenn? No, I don't, because I think ultimately, um, you know, there are, I mean, there's so many players now in the high street. It's not just retail and hospitality. You know, it is the, it is some of the big education establishments of there, whether it be their FE colleges or universities. Uh, it's also about making our, our town centres living communities. Uh, it's about all of those things and getting that, getting that mix right. Uh, so that maybe will require, a, a, you know, a bigger range of players. And I've said, well, look, ultimately, it's not who's on this task force. It's what they deliver. And that is the key thing. Um, and I think that what we've, Ultimately, you know, we have literally a year left in this assembly. I think the real opportunities to shape um, will come in the next programme of government at the start of the 2022 assembly term, when the assembly hopefully will have a full four or five year run. Uh, I think that's where I see the task force in policy terms having the most impact. Um, and I see it not just as this little niche body, but also a mainstream part of the executive's post-pandemic recovery process. I think they've got to play that crucial central role in that. And, you know, our town centres are key economic drivers in terms of our economy. And, you know, what I want is, you know, to be, as I said at the start, those ecosystems of, of lots of different types of business. You know, I want to see the next generation of retail entrepreneurs. I want to find them home in, the, in our town and city centres. You know, 
where things are moving very fast now. We don't know quite what the post-pandemic high street will be like, but it's going to be very different. It's going to be certainly cleaner, greener. It's going to be much more, uh, I think, opportunities for public transport, for walking, but at the same time, the traditional things, making sure that we have a competitive and affordable car parking. So there's a lot of players around that around this table, and it's how we pull them together and get a strategy that ultimately delivers. I think that's the key, Glenn. I mean, and I agree with a lot of what you've just said about how to, how to pull those together. Because I suppose it strikes me, and I know Stephen Mitterrey and my colleagues on, the, on this call as well, it strikes me back to the 1970s when I was before, I was hardly more than born, but the, 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 invented, the government then invented Craig Avon, and Craig Avon as a dream didn't really work. And I'm tying that in my own mind with what Aidan has said today. I mean, none of this is, we'll not fix this in 12 months or 18 months. I think we do need a vision. And that's why I actually agree with the points that Aidan, um, Aidan come up with in terms of his presentation. But probably I, I accept what you're saying, but I suppose it just was reservations about the representative part where, where you are holding a role in terms of the membership. And I know you have been a strongly against much of the out-of-town development, which has, in my opinion, always had a part to play. But in some points, I have to agree that it has been the destruction of some of our high streets as well. But I think there's a balance to be struck because whilst we looked at other countries across Europe today, or whether reference has been made, there has been very good, successful uh, out-of-town examples across in mainland England. So I, I think there's a mixture to have. I don't think we've done it very well in Northern Ireland. I think we've tried to do too many in too many different places. Um, and for that, I would actually support you because it has been instruction in many cases of the high street. Okay, thank you uh, for, for that, Trevor. And, and thank you, uh, Glenn, for, for that. I, I think we'll move on just to see if we can encompass more uh, rounded rather than specific uh, comments. And if we could move on and bring uh, Phil Prentice, the Chief Officer of Scotland's Towns Partnership. And I suppose really the, the reason for inviting Phil to come along and, and give uh, an input today is really from that concept of there's no point in reinventing the wheel if there are other uh, places that have undergone the transformation or the process that we're looking uh, for this high street task force to deliver. It certainly makes sense to, 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 to speak to people that have been involved. And, and we know, Phil, that you have uh, other experiences of other uh, processes in other places as well. So we, you're very welcome to the committee today. Thank you for taking time to join us. Uh, and I'll pass over to yourself maybe to give us a, a few minutes uh, of your experiences and then maybe we'll open up the members for questions after that. Okay, thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Can and uh, yes. It's good to hear the accent. I mean, I'm away 29 years but uh, I feel as if I've just landed back home again. So I'm, I'm, the wee, um, I'm the wee Northern Irish guy that does it for Scotland's Towns. Uh, Scotland's Towns Partnership was created post the uh, financial crash. So there was a different crisis at that point in time. Uh, there was a recognition that Scotland was very much a nation of towns. A lot of its population wasn't city centric. We've got a couple of cities, Edinburgh, Glasgow, both very small. Uh, we've got a couple of pretend cities, Aberdeen, Dundee, and then we've got three cities that, to be honest, are just small towns, Inverness, Perth and Stirling. So by and large, 70% of the population of Scotland does not live in a city. It lives in a town, a rural settlement, a village, an island. And that's why Scottish government started to think, what do we do about our towns? Because bluntly, we had hollowed them out for about 30 years. We built in far too much retail. And then as people started to move online, or to the edge of town or to retail destinations, the towns really lost their sense of purpose. The cities to a certain extent also drained their hinterland towns rather than irrigating them. They drained all the economic activity, all the big investments went to the city and then bang, we, we come down with COVID and that started to reverse. We're seeing a big renaissance across towns uh, with more blended work patterns and less commuting, etc. So in terms of our approach, we we took a very holistic approach and we decided not to set up a talking shop. We just said, look, the last thing a country like Scotland needs is another public sector agency running around the place, squeaking at people, telling them what to do, becoming all bureaucratic and driven by admin. What you need is a disruptor. So I spoke to the cabinet secretary at the time, Derek Mackay, who was the minister for local government and said, look, 
I'm currently heading up e economic development regeneration in the local government sector. I know how to do this. I've come from a private sector background. I know what needs to be done. Let's just set up a very small body with a representative board but become operational. Let's just get things done. So that's where STP moved in. We just became a disruptor, a collaborative a body that pulls together the disparate sectors, the institutional investments, developers, national retail, local retail, house builders, energy, digital culture, tourism, the whole shebang. We built the data model. So we've got a typology for all of our towns, which means it was the, the, the tourism uh, speaker. I mean, not every town is going to become a tourist town. And sometimes we put too much emphasis on tourism. I mean, Northern Ireland's beautiful. It's a lovely country. I, I really miss not being able to get over at the minute, but I'm going to be sneaking over in a couple of weeks' time. It's beautiful. And you don't have the disadvantage that some of the towns in England and Scotland had, which was complete cloning. So whenever I do go home, believe it or not, I wait till I get back. Uh, most of my family are from County Armagh. So I've still got some family who live on the outskirts of Armagh, some people who live around Portadown, Lurgan. I actually wait every year to go home to buy all my gents clothing in Portadown because I've got about six really good gents outfitters and I can buy clothes in Portadown that I could never buy anywhere else across uh, Scotland. Likewise, the food offer, it's more local, it's better sourced, it tastes better than the rubbish that we buy out of Tesco and Asda and stuff over here. So I think you've got a good starting point. You still do have a sort of fundamental underbelly of really good family businesses, family owned pubs, restaurants. So that you've got something to play with, but you just need to have a vision and you need to be able to enact that. So whenever the Town Centre Action Plan was published in 2014, we were established to drive that uh, policy forward, to be the central point, the, the sort of trusted, credible people in the middle that were making sense of a very complex thing. So we worked with all of the sectors and we started to drive lots of demonstration projects, how to repopulate town centres, how to think about ageing demographic, dementia-friendly towns, how to think about net zero, low carbon, et cetera, et cetera. So we have made significant progress, and the Scottish Government have now got the capability of actually investing lots of money out across the country via uh, my organisation. We also work closely with the Development Trust Association. So for the smaller, more rural towns, we've got 250 development trusts in Scotland, and we've also got a lot of business improvement districts. But we've been pushing that model a bit further. Uh, we currently have 40 operational bids, and that goes from big ones in Edinburgh, uh, smaller ones in Glasgow, small town bids. But we've pushed the model out to have food and drink improvement districts, digital improvement districts, tourism improve improvement districts. So you just get the beauty of that was whenever the pandemic came, big government is trying to support local government, who are then in turn trying to support local communities. And to be honest, they're so distant, they don't know anything about that local community. Having those local collaboratives in place allowed us to get investment down onto the ground where local people knew the local community, they knew the people that needed help, and they also knew the people who were able to give that help, and things were improved a lot uh, quicker. So thinking about maybe having town centre partnerships are more sort of support from chambers, our business improvement districts, our development trusts, is definitely useful having that sort of infrastructure and local community collaboration on the ground. We underpinned everything by town centre first principle. For too long, we were stretching the environment. We were building boxes in the middle of a farmer's field. We were shoving our hospitals into the middle of nowhere. We were building medical centres where people had to jump on buses or travel long distances. So the town centre first principle is basically now saying, if you're going to use public money for a big investment, you must think about the damage or the potential opportunity around your town. Could that not be located in the heart of the town centre to drive footfall, to reduce carbon footprint? and so on. So Town Centre First was a key driver. Now, I sit as a director in the UK task force as well, and I'm currently advising the Welsh uh, Transforming Towns programme, and I have been working with your colleagues south of the border on the sort of borderland initiatives and so on. So there's nothing different than what you're talking about. There's absolutely nothing. But I would resist going down the route of a talking shop. I think you just need to put some investment in to get things up and running. It's not a lot of money. For example, Scotland's Towns Partnership operates on a budget of roughly £400,000 a year, and that covers all of the data, the website, the events, the learning, 
the Business Improvement District programme. You know, if you went into a town centre and tried to do a wee bit of civic realm work, £400,000 buys you a new pavement. You know, in reality, we have been able to support hundreds of settlements. So we are moving towards a new future for Scotland's towns. Our policy was published on the 3rd of February. So not only did we have war leading town centre policy, we have now made it even better. And to be honest, Westminster and Cardiff are following uh, most of the policies that we have developed. So the new future is te taking on board some of the comments that your earlier speakers have mentioned. It's looking at the tax base. It's looking at modernizing business rates and actually using the business rate system as an incentive to get smaller niche startup independent quirkier retailers back into the town. But understanding that retail will always be a key element. It's looking at the fact that we need to put our public services back into town to make them accessible to people. So we, we build in health centres, we build in educational institutions, council headquarters. We don't build them in the middle of a lake in Craig Avon. We shove them right into the middle of a town. And that's basically where the council staff then benefit the businesses within the town. And it just gives the whole town more vibrancy. So we have three sets of recommendations. The first one is about planning and embedding towns and city centres more firmly into economic policies. Again, I was part of the first city deal in Scotland, and I'm not a big fan of city deals. I think, again, there's a risk that they will just suck up all of the energy and drain the surrounding towns. So, for example, if you were just going down that, you know, sort of blunt approach with Belfast, what happens to Bangor or to Lisburn, even as far out as Sainfield and Downpatrick and towns like that, because the energy will be sucked into the city and all the big investments that actually mean people have to go to the city for employment or for education. You know, that, to me, there's a lot of learning in Scotland where we have took a more regional approach and we've made sure that towns are built into the hierarchy of that type of investment. So uh, urge caution on the, on the city deal approach, but planning, we are, are currently going through our National Planning Framework 4 and towns are going to be critical in terms of the recovery. We have seen a lot of uh, city centre grade one class uh, offices actually saying to their staff, you're not coming back. You can sit in your home and you can work in, in a blended pattern. You might need to come in once a month. You might need to come in once a week. But by and large, we're selling the big office to a housing developer and we're going to move into a smaller office. So towns are going to have the gift of having all of those people and their expenditure in uh, in their in their grip. In the past, they wouldn't have had them because they were commuting. There's lots of opportunity around that. So we need to plan for more housing. We need to think about our aging demographic and build housing products for our parents' generation. We need to use uh, the, the redundant retail space to actually create new housing opportunities for Generation X, Y, Z, and think about the younger people who don't want a big lifetime mortgage, just want to be able to plug and play, move about the place until they're in their 30s anyway. So that's the first set of recommendations. The second is around the difficult stuff, the tax, how to look at digital. You know, do we look at a digital sales tax? Is it based on a transaction? If it is, it's probably just going to be passed on to the consumer and nobody wins. How do we actually tax those big online platforms? And it's likely to be something around turnover. So we need to sort of explore how we get to the bottom of that. New build housing is zero rated for VAT. And yet if you go in to try and repurpose a building in the high street, it costs you 20% VAT. So how do we actually say for sustainability, net zero, carbon friendly, how do we actually take that 20% disadvantage away and maybe put some of it onto the new build sprawl that we don't want to see. So that's the second. The really tricky bits are going to be the second. Some of those are actually uh, devolved to the Scottish Parliament, and we're, we've already set up a tax and property group to look at that. Some of them still remain reserved to Westminster. But again, through the links on the UK task force, we've started to raise those issues. And the final thing is just proof through demonstration. Some of these complexities are probably too big for the council guy to get into his head. You know, how do I fix that shopping centre? It's wrecked. There's nobody in it anymore. People are wandering around thinking, you know, who, who's going to fix this? So we're looking at demonstration projects where we can get the public sector working with the right type of private sector and communities to repurpose things like shopping centres that are laying half empty are really going to struggle long term or to take space in the high street and let communities actually take ownership of that and let the communities decide what goes in there. And it could be around 
local production, it could be co-working environments, it could be a young enterprise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's do proof through demonstration. We're just about to launch the Climate Action Towns program, which again will will encourage things like local energy systems, local community ownership of energy, micro wind generation, battery storage, electrification, and the the government for the first time have really really put their money where their mouths are. There's 275 million being put into the place-based infrastructure investment program and a further 500 million in the program for government for active travel and the electrification of our town and city centres. Do you know, it's a time of real, really good opportunity. And in Northern Ireland, I think if your task force could actually get some form of small executive just to drive this forward and make sense of what is sometimes overcomplicated, you know, we just too much retail, not enough people living in the town, We've got net zero to deal with. That's, to me, a fairly simple thing to start making progress with. But I'll be honest, I've been picking up with Chris Stewart and the team. I'm more than happy to feed in moving forward in terms of acting as a sounding board, um, a a sort of, I I don't know, an expert advisor to a certain extent. Because, uh, do you know what? It's my place. I might be in Scotland 29 years, but I'm still from Northern Ireland. It's my home. Anyway, that's me blather over. Thank you very much indeed for that, um, Phil. And I, I suppose uh, it did pop into my head that we've got, we've got a guy from, from the north that's working in Scotland, that's advising England, Wales and the south, that it's about time that we tapped into that resource and, and, and utilise that here uh, for, for um, you know, the work that we're going to do going forward. Um, and thank you for, for giving us the, the experiences that you've had. Um, I'm going to open it up to, to members for a conversation in a minute and we'll follow our more sort of traditional model. So I think we'll bring uh, uh, the vice chair in next and, and, and then um, open up to members. But I suppose the one thing that struck me is just your concept, and, and I know this to many people in Northern Ireland, this may seem strange, somebody from the assembly asking what a disruptor is. But w- w- what is, what, I mean, when you talk about that sense of, disruptor what sort of things do people really need to be grabbing and shaking from the core to try and achieve that change and i mean do you mean by some of that like the sense that like the civil service just needs to move out of its comfort zone and move and do things maybe that they wouldn't have done previously what what sort of disruption was needed and i know it's with the small day if we can say it like that yeah yeah. hey the, the 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 beauty of STP, why I said STP needed to become a disruptor was the civil servant, civil service is so constrained. You know, there's lots of bureaucracy and procurement, and this was an agenda that needed to be driven forward very quickly. Uh, STP needed to have that freedom. So we needed to be trusted and credible. Uh, We needed to be able to move across the different sectors. So in the morning, I'll speak to, I don't know, uh, Blackstone and the United States, an institutional investor who maybe owns half the shopping centres, who's no interest in the country whatsoever. In the afternoon, I'll be speaking with community groups. In the evening, I'll be speaking to the cabinet secretary. You needed somebody who had fleet of foot that was able to work across all of that environment without the constraints of being stuck in civil servants, uh, sort of the, all the bureaucracy that goes along with that. But you couldn't be an outright public, a private sector person because then you would have lobbies and everybody bleating on about their specific industry. Something that you can gain comfort with is this is a long-term game. This is not a short-term fix. We know the trends around retail shift and citizen behaviour. We know the need for net zero. If you just piece this together bit by bit, you know we're all doing 60 years of decline. You can't do that in five or 10 years. This is 20, 30 years worth of just getting the policies right. Start to punish the bad actors, the sprawl, the out of town, start to reward and encourage and incentivize the good behavior, which is repopulation, net zero, community ownership, community wealth. Stop allowing people to plunder our local economies and to extract that to Panama or to give it to Amazon when the money goes to China. Start just locking that money into your local economy and just really value what you've got. And I, 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 honestly, I can't, I can't state it enough. I love, I love jumping on that boat in, in Kern Rand to get back home. And the minute I get back home, I feel, you know, it's a special island. It really is a special place. And there is lots of things to be proud about. You know, you go in and you buy your, your meat out of a proper craft butcher. You get your clothing that's been, you know, really carefully sourced. And then there's the beauty just of the environment. So 
And one point I would make about tourism, don't focus too much on tourism. There's plenty of towns. And one of the towns I worked with on the ground a way back was a town called Barhead, which is on the outskirts of Glasgow. Mm. Nobody in their right mind would ever visit Barhead unless they came from Barhead. Right? Sure. You have to work with towns in that ilk as well. What we done with Barhead was we spoke to the people and said, what do you want? Uh, well, we'd actually like better health facilities. We'd like a nice shop in the middle. Why can't we get a leisure center? And basically, we just delivered that. So Barhead now is a very highly functioning town with better health outcomes, better educational achievement, better employment outcomes. It's more climate friendly. But you know what? You still wouldn't visit it. It's never going to be a tourist town, but it functions perfectly for the people who live in that town. And that was done collaboratively with some public investment, but primarily the public investment was to give the private guys confidence that this place was going to be looked after. I spent maybe 25 million to kickstart it, and then the private sector came in with about another 90. So that there is a message that all of these, every single place can be improved, but it needs to be done collectively. And I think post COVID, we've realized the value of having the community voice, the unheard voices within our society, bringing them to the table and think, how do we actually build better places that work for everybody instead of making some guy in Panama rich? Let's just keep the money to ourselves. Okay, Phil, um, thank you for that. So I'm going to pass over now to um, to, to Doug, um, who's probably going to follow on with all the name checks of all those Porta Downs and Craig Alvins and Lurgans, no doubt there. But also, <laughs> just to say that if any member wants to draw in any of the previous speakers to clarify anything, that that still is an option because many of those um, speakers from earlier are, are still online. So uh, go, go on ahead, Doug, with your questions. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Chair. And, and you're absolutely right, of course. Um, Phil, really good to, to speak to you. Strangely, um, you know, I used to live in um, Edinburgh and Kingussi and in Inverness and a lot of the things that you're talking about, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I'm now back in Portadown with a local butcher right beside the office that I'm sitting in now. So um, I'm getting I'm getting that, that that real sense of what you were talking about in the town. But I guess it, here's the question, and it might drag in the, the, the team from Nilga as well in regards to this, is that you did talk about, you know, but, you know, the, the building of the out-of-town shopping centres like Rushmere by the Craig Avon Lakes. I mean, how do you reverse that? Because that has now become such an established place for people to go to that it is sucking trade out of Portadown. It is sucking trade um, out of out of Lurgan. And as far as the council is then concerned, is that Craig Avon itself is becoming a town centre. Um, so how do you... How do you how do you stop that? Uh, I mean, it, there's a real competing narrative here is that we've actually got local council creating a town centre, which is stripping out the services from another two town centres. Yeah, well, the, the short answer to that is we don't want to pick it. It's already there and you have to work around it. So, I mean, I know the plan, uh, some of my family owned land in Craig Avon, the farmland that was uh, bought up and then they had to buy it back. Uh, the, 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 the second city concept didn't quite come off. I mean, it was well intended. We had lots of new towns in Scotland that actually did work, like Livingston and Irvine. just didn't work in Northern Ireland. I'm not sure why, but uh, irrespective of that, uh, what Portadown and Lurgan need to do is give something different. You know, there needs to be a core offer for the resident populations in both those towns. And then, you know, whatever happens with the centre of Craig Avon, which is a difficult thing because... You know, you've got the lakes, you've got the civic centre, you've got Rushmere, uh, and then you've got lots of different housing estates and um, about a million roundabouts. So I, I, you can't unpick it, but we still have lots of out of town. What we're saying now is there's a proliferation of this and we don't need any more. So part of our policy that went out in February was a five-year moratorium, no more. Let's just see what happens after five years. But I, 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 I'm quite happy that People can go and have that retail destination experience. You know, that's fine. But just make sure that the people in Portadown are not disadvantaged. So one of the policies that we're bringing forward is a car park levy for Rushmere. So if Rushmere were sitting in Scotland, we would actually charge people because they can dump their car all day, walk around the, the retail warehouses and so on. And the people who go into Portadown are probably getting chased down by wardens if they sit more than half an hour. So we're trying to take... 
a rebalancing of bad behaviour, which is big carbon footprint, driving a long distance just to wander around shops and buy a load of rubbish, as opposed to maybe using better behaviours around active travel and going down for essential stuff in your own local town. It's trying to create a furnace. There is an inequity in the system just now. It's very, very difficult because you know there's a law of unintended consequence which you guys will all be familiar with. So none of this is going to happen in Scotland overnight. We will engage with Retail Consortium, Grocers Federation, uh, with the owners of these shopping centres to try and work out a system of fairness and making sure that we've got a progressive taxation system which actually encourages more localism, entrepreneurship, um, which, to be fair, starting point for Northern Ireland, you've got a very good base of that already. Build on it. Thanks, Phil. I don't know if, if any of the, the Nilgit guys are still here or not, um, Chair, but I don't know if they want, wanted to comment on that. Yeah, happy to. And really, it's just to amplify what, what, what Phil has said. I mean, um, uh, the point in time that we're at um, is an, ups, an absolute opportunity. Um, there are going to be uh, satellite towns. I think Phil had mentioned the likes of Barhead. And I lived in Glasgow, and uh, I take his point. I also know of a place called Denny outside Falkirk, where I went to buy a bottle of wine, and the police escorted me in and out of the off license. That has changed because of an enabling planning policy and because people who are not institutionally driven but are um, genuinely committed to local people, pride and place driven can start to effectively act as fifth columnists. So they're not the civil servants or in local government case, uh, Mr. Beatty, the public servants, because we're not civil servants, as you know. But that energy, that passion can change the legislation so that, and, and I, I'm uh, in a former life a runner, and I used to take my son to play football, and I used to uh, train outside Lurgan. And I ran into Lurgan one evening in the summer, and I was so impressed. And a lot of people may have perceptions that it might have been a little bit like what Phil's comment about Barhead was it's unearthing that talent and making sure, I suppose, as centralists, which the executive um, uh, is, and as localists, what local government is, we divest and devolve to communities. And that tends to be, you know, a mixture of venture capitalists who build those shopping centres, but have got to adapt their own physical uh, investment and uh, the community wealth builders, in other words, the people in 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 in, in the Lurgans, and, and and this whole conversation, the thread running through it, is about pride in local, pride in local people, places, heritage, and we have to invert that pyramid, which sounds a bit nebulous and philosophical, Mr. Beatty, but I suppose the urgency and the enthusiasm and the toolkit is there. I just think it has to be deployed in a faster, better, and frankly more local way to unearth that talent and start to reshape it. We can't look back even to yesterday, what's done's done. But I, I think that enabling role rather than cannot approach or over technical bureaucratic uh, approach is what's needed now. And we've never had a better opportunity because everybody's open for change. Because if we're not, we're just going to be stuck uh, under the skin of COVID recovery for much longer than we want to be. Uh, great responses, Derek and, and Phil. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks very much, Doug. If I could go on now, please, to Martina, please. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for presenting in front of us today. It was difficult because of the time frame that we had. I would have liked to ask uh, more questions, but just going back in relation to the long-term strategy that was mentioned in, in the context of Scotland and obviously here too. Uh, the high street, uh, as Aidan had said, has changed long before COVID. Um, we were all witnessing it. We all seen it. We were all concerned about what was happening. And I was um, I was interested in what you said about your representative board because you said it was small. Um, and you said that that was part of the factor that was making it work. Now, I know that people like Glenn and others have been campaigning for 10 years for this task force. For, for the North here, but there's only been in government here for under this executive for less than a year. And thankfully we have it. And it's trying to learn the lessons that we can. One of the things that struck me was that your task force includes uh, board representation from the foundry and community sector. 
Yeah. And when I was listening then to you talk about how you go to whether it's social enterprises, perhaps community arts, how you hand things over to the community, how you make town centres vibrant and the community can play a part in that. Could you, could you, could you discuss uh, more of the benefits of that with us? Because the inclusion of the community and voluntary sector, I think, is going to be vital uh, for retail to be able to attract people back, to encourage people to go back into the town centre, maybe even after what has happened during COVID, uh, the pattern now is to go online, order online, because it's the only access that you can have at this moment. And if we're going to try to change that and have a, a vibrant town centres and city centres, then we need to, I think, access more the voluntary community sector who have an opportunity to reach those hard to reach people even, uh, as, as one might call them in, in communities. Yeah, that's a very valid point. We recognised early on that places are so unique, but they're just made up of stories and of people and communities. And we had let, we had let ownership and control of that go to absentee and extractive economic models. And now we're just trying to pull it back. If you don't bring the community in, they won't engage. Uh, I, I remember uh, one of my projects in Barhead, we said to the local community, uh, we'll build you a, a 4G AstroTurf pitch. Great. We don't want one. Give us give us half a pitch. And I never listened to him. I built him a pitch. Princess Anne turned up the next day. I got a call from the police. They've burnt it down. They poured petrol down the drains. They didn't want your stupid pitch. And I asked them why. And they said, listen, you, we asked for half a pitch. You give us a full pitch. Full pitch work for all the people around us are rich. Their kids will come down and book that pitch and it'll become part of their, they'll own it. And we'll be asked to guard their cars and that's about the height of it. Give us half a pitch because nobody wants a half a football pitch. So build them half a pitch and it worked. You know, you have to listen to the people on the ground genuinely. Development Trust Association is something that you might want to consider replicating in Northern Ireland because you just get the people who are caring about their community listening to the unheard groups, the disability groups, the minority groups, the refugees that have come into the country, the people that we need to embrace in a new world moving forward. It's all part of our story. It's all part, it's the people that make the difference. Too many people have not had had a voice over a long period of time. And we spent six months this year listening to them. And it was really encouraging just to hear how keen they were. So Sterling, for example, has created a in the middle of their town, they've taken over an old retail unit. They've got a hundred artists and crafters. And every time they put on an event or a festival, there's thousands of people coming into the town to engage with that. kirkcaldy has got a greener initiative, again, about 300. So bring, bring your community. If you don't talk to your communities and your development trusts and your charities, you're going nowhere. Start letting the smaller voices have a bigger say. Okay, Martina, are you happy enough there? Yes, okay. So Trevor Clark, you're looking in next there, please. Thank, thanks very much, Taylor. It's, it's just uh, Colin Neal had been sending me a message in response to maybe comments I had made and he'd like an opportunity maybe to come back in. He had no forum to contact you through the chair, but I think he wants to address something that I had said and I think that would only be a bit right to give him that opportunity. Absolutely. Colin, are you there if you want to come in? Just, I think you should be able to just um, unmute yourself there. Go on ahead. I have indeed, Chair. Thank yeah. you. Uh, it was really just around the, the structure. I suppose I mean, what I've been saying is it should be smaller. I, I, I don't think it, I'm not saying even I should be on it. I'm saying it should be skills and knowledge led. It definitely should have a cross section of you know society, community groups, union type people, all of that, and mm -hmm. like representatives. My my only concern is that um, because it's if you take thirty strong and everybody's equal, it's you know, any sort of voice is outweighed two to one by government departments, and I think they should be there as advisors, special advisors, rather than actually if you like voting members. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I certainly I think that was a point w well made and, and one that may maybe will certainly give consideration to, to following up. Can I just double check with members? Is there anybody else that, that's looking to come in? Um, we are just running uh, over time, so I, I'll be happy enough if people are content enough to leave it there. Um, 
if we are then, what we'll do if we uh, draw this um, section to a close, uh, maybe just before we do, actually, I will ask um, George okay. Robinson if he's there. I know George sometimes prefers to be called in. George, are you there? Uh, I'm chair. Yes, yes. Go, on, go on ahead there with a the question. Chair, it's just if uh, Glenn, Glenn or Aidan's still there. Yes, both, uh, sir. I know they're, talk they're talking about the, the task force and so forth. And to my mind, uh, the town centre manager and um, the chambers of trade are people that I think that should should be involved because um, they, they know they know the lo local town, the local area, and um, I think they're they're very very important people that uh, the, the task force should should be uh, joining up with. That's just my observation. And maybe another one is um, the online shopping. I mean, we're talking about town centres and so forth, and I think at the present time, and I know it's, it's a great facility to have the, the online shopping, but uh, to my mind, it's doing a lot, a lot of damage to, um, to the, particularly the, the bigger towns. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank, thanks very much. But maybe, um, Aidan or others, maybe expanding on that, is, is, is there a... A model potentially that if we've gone too big with the thirty members and uh, and not enough advisors, is there an opportunity for for input on a more local level that could cascade up the way into a task force? You could the task force have some layers below. It? You don't want it to get complicated and too big, but maybe just dovetail then what George has said there. Aidan, would you have any thoughts on that? I think we need to be very careful on this in the fact that um, this has to be uh, a both ground up and, uh, you know, the, the, the innovation then being reflected down. But the important thing is that it, that it is ground up um, and, and that we do have that input at a granular level when it comes to making plans for individual towns and individual areas. As far as the, the, the premise is, is concerned, um, there is going to be a need for, for strategy. There is going to be a need to vision, uh, uh, as far as vision. And those subgroups are going to be hugely um, important. Um, just like, uh, uh, as Colin said, you know, I don't need to be a member. Um, uh, you know, there are other people who, who should be brought in as far as expertise and whatever. Um, I sort of look at the wider picture stuff when it comes to the rest of Europe and, and, and what's happening across the UK and, and that sort of thing. But there's one thing that we have um, going for us in Northern Ireland, um, which is that um, there are very easy uh, ways to communicate with local representatives. There are very easy ways uh, to communicate with our political reps and there's very easy ways to, to sort of feed in. I think this... Uh, group needs to be that sort of extra uh, channel and and the big rub the big friction here is how do you turn vision strategic vision into granular delivery on a, on a local level the only other thing i'll add is uh, i'm very disappointed to hear one of you one of the other uh, 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 people giving evidence talk about people walking around spending money on rubbish they don't need Retail, one of the good things we have here in Northern Ireland is we have an eclectic mix and we also have a symbiotic relationship between large retail and small retail. Um, people will go and buy one thing uh, and, and go to uh, at, a, at, a, at a name and will go to a small retailer for, for something else. I think we need to be very careful about what we are trying to do. All retail plays a significant welcome part um, to the economic mix that we have here in Northern Ireland. The big retailers are the biggest rates payers here in Northern Ireland. They are the biggest payers in to bids. And what we should be building on is uh, 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 learning the lessons of why you know, those places have been successful. It's because they're accessible, it's because they're bright, it's because they have uh, cheap or, or free car parking, it's because they have a wonderful way of marketing themselves and it's because they have a way of getting people, and I'll go back to what I said at the start, they have a way of getting people to spend their time, not just their, their money. I think where we need to go with this, and, and one of the reasons why I was quite keen to be involved or have some sort of involvement from, from retail consortium members is the only way we're going to deliver this and deliver it on that 10, 20, and 30 year basis that I'm talking about is if we do this in partnership, looking at the eclectic mix that we have and build on it. Okay, Colin Neil, you're looking back in there again, maybe just to give another contribution. Chair, yeah, if I could, I think, again, because of the structures we have been given, if you like, rather than, than the setting up, I think, you know, 
this is not about doing things to local communities. I think it's doing it with it. And I think if, if the group was structured in that the subgroups were decided by the board rather than given to them, that's where additional, if you like, representation uh, and regional people could be involved um, to have the input. But the whole structure has to be about facilitating each area to do what suits it. This is not about coming out and saying, well, look, you know, we're going to say, here's the standard model for your town centre. It's really helping the, the town centres, the people that use them and the local authorities and all understand their opportunities and facilitate them getting it. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Listen, I'm going to call us to, to an end there because we, we, we have run over time. I, I want to, to, to thank everybody for their contributions today and probably not least by the fact that the range of people that we have and then to put a time limit of, of about two hours was very ambitious. Um, I think that there isn't one of you from your respective sectors that we couldn't have brought in and spent two hours talking to. And I think um, if there's one thing that the committee has been keen that it wants to do, it's very clearly to send the message, I think along with the executive, that the revitalization of the high streets right across Northern Ireland is a key priority. It is something that we want to see happening because that need was there pre-COVID, has been exasperated by COVID uh, and will be there when COVID goes. And, and I think if we can even use some of the agility that the government has learnt over the last sort of 12 months and been able to, to deal and respond with issues. I think that type of model going forward may be something that will help us to give uh, some very important first aid to, to the high street when it really, really needs it. So I know that each of you are involved in sectors that we will undoubtedly be in contact with again in the period of time ahead. Can I thank you for your time with us this afternoon and your expertise? And what we will do is at the end of our meeting today, we will certainly take on board a few of the ideas that you have suggested and a few things that you've highlighted, and we will make those known uh, to the executive office ministers uh, uh, as part of this process. So th thank you very much indeed for that. Um, and what I will do is I'll maybe just say to members, if you want to take uh, maybe two to three minute break while we uh, lose all those members that were with us so far and bring our next people up into the uh, spotlight. And maybe if I could ask the comms team then if we could just uh, close the session then for about uh, two or three minutes. Thank you very much, members. Thank you. Thank you. Back online again. Okay, thank you, Carla. Okay, so folks, we're back uh, live again. Thank you for just taking a few minutes of rest there after a long enough session previously. Um, we'll move on to item 12 now, which is a, the, an input from the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman uh, in relation to part three of the Public Services Ombudsman Act, Northern Ireland 2016. Members, the details... Uh, for uh, that are in pages 73 to 127 of the meeting pack. If I could take this opportunity to welcome uh, Margaret Kelly, who is the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman, uh, maybe not immediately new to post, but um, certainly new to um, meeting with ourselves here. So we'll take the opportunity to welcome you, Margaret, and to wish you very well in your post. I think I can see that you're joined today as well by Sean Martin from um, the, the office. So um, we would like to welcome you to the committee today. Uh, and maybe what we'll do is we'll just pass over to yourselves and let you give us the, the short uh, introduction to the issue that you're looking to update us on today. And then we can open it up uh, for clarity and question from members after that. So Margaret, we're happy enough to pass over to yourself. Thank you, Colin. Emma, just checking you can hear me okay? Yes, indeed. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon to members of the committee and thank you um, for taking the opportunity um, to let us come along and talk to you about the Complaint Standards Authority. Um, I've provided the committee with an overview of the work that we've been doing to date, but just wanted to say a few words about it. Um, the provisions on the Complaint Standards Authority were actually tabled by your predecessor committee 
as the Public Services Ombudsman Bill was making its way through. And really, um, and I'm not sure if some people are members of it at that time, but they tabled it because they looked at Scotland and they looked at the Complaint Standards Authority role there and were impressed by the impact of that role and wanted a similar role for Northern Ireland. But before that could be commenced, wanted to take an opportunity, A, to get the rest of the office up and running, B, um, to give a, a scrutiny to it, which you are looking at for me today. Um, so I took up post at the very end of August and have been appointed as Ombudsman for seven years. And, and you might think it's a little bit early in my appointment to be coming and asking you um, to commence the powers of the Complaint Standards Authority. But really, I'm really focused in my role on improvement and learning. Um, and individual complaints are incredibly important to my office, and it's incredibly important that individuals get redress. But it is equally important that we learn the lessons of those complaints and that we look at the threads that are on different complaints and we look at some of the themes of those and we use them to really work with public services to make improvements. And that's why I um, would really like the committee to take a look at Complaint Standards Authority and we seek your support around it. Um, in terms of preparing for this, um, the office is on taken a really substantial piece of research both with complainants and complaint handlers and it's thrown up some of the reasons why we think complaint standards it would be really helpful to put in place so people complain when their needs aren't being met when they get poor service or they encounter poor staff attitude and they often don't complain even if they feel they have need to if they have a fear that somehow it will impact the service they and their family will face or if they have barriers that prohibit them from complaining. And the complainants that we talked to said that when they complained, actually particularly if those complaints went on for a long time without resolution, it was really stressful, it really impacted on both their physical and mental well-being, and it often actually left them both angry and distressed. Um, we looked at the different public sector bodies here, we find huge differences in the number of stages and approaches to complaint handling. Some people had two stages, some three, some four, and some even five. And it also meant there was very long delays. We find that there was a real lack of clarity and confusion about what constitutes a complaint. And in fact, in talking to some MLAs, they've been saying that at times they've been requesting information and had that treated as a formal complaint. We found a really complex and confusing landscape. And in particular, we spoke to the families who were part of the Dunmire Manor Home Treats um, report. And they said they really struggled to know where to go with their complaint. So they complained to the care home and didn't get a response. They complained to the trust and didn't get a resolution. And they complained to RQIA. They went round and round the complaints landscape that wasn't clear for them and didn't give them resolution or address. Now, I would say that those families did not come directly to NIPSO, and I do think that's an issue for us about doing some more reaching out and engaging, but it's also an issue about just how confusing that landscape is. We also talked to complaint handlers and complaint managers, and they really felt their role was crucial, but also really quite complex and challenging. And that was particularly the case if they were the part of a large multi-departmental organisation. Um, and they felt that often they needed access to training and support that wasn't there for them. And the other thing that the research found, which I think would come out of Complaints Managers Authority, was that there is no clear overview and data on the number and types of complaints they take or indeed the outcomes in terms of whether or not they are upheld and what changes they bring. So the research for us showed a complaints landscape really in need of um, some clarity, some streamlining and lots of support and guidance. The complaint standards function has been in effect in Scotland for just coming up um, to 10 years. And it is now that they are beginning to see the real benefit of having a clear system in place and the real benefit of being able to learn the lessons. 
both Wales and Scotland have already powered sufficient stumped, but in fact have chosen to put a complaint standards approach in place on a voluntary basis because they recognise um, both for complainants and complaint handlers and also public representatives the need for that clarity. Part of our um, strategy and planning has been to review and take account of reports where complaint culture and complaint handling have been identified as a real issue. So the Home Truth reports, the review of leadership and governance in Muckamore and the O'Hara report. And I think if you look at all of those reports, those early opportunities to really deal with those complaints properly and appropriately and if they had reached the end of the stage where the body itself could deal with them to refer them on in the right manner where i think missed and if you look at somewhere like muckamore the fact that there was no complaints actually should have been a real red flag because as actually a good service does get complaints because it is open and listening to people. As part of our preparation, we really increased our engagement with public bodies. Um, and in fact, this morning I was speaking to one of the chief executives of one of the local councils who would come under the Complaint Standards Authority. And they were saying they would actually welcome, so they would welcome support to get their process down to two stages, to have a clear set of principles, to have a clear complaint handling scheme. So we have found a will, and also in terms of the complaint handlers in public bodies, they've already began to form informal networks, which are the kind of approach we would use to support the development and implementation of the scheme. So what, so if the committee scrutinises and supports complaint standards authority, what does it actually mean? So it would mean that we would have a draft statement of principles that we'd actually go to full con public consultation, which would be the principles around actually making and handling complaints. And that statement of principles would also have to come to the floor of assembly for um, resolution. So we would go publicly consult with bodies and then would come to the floor of the assembly. We would also work with the different public sectors to introduce a model complaints handling procedure so they so local councils would all have the same model complaints handling procedure health trusts would have schools would have and for people who need to complain there's a real clarity in that because they can access it and they know what it should look like and there is also a clarity and a support for the bodies and um, all of those would be developed through consultation development approach and through a learning approach so overall, what we would hope is that CSA would transform the culture of complaints over time here, that it would put in place a really accessible system of complaints, it would make it easier for people to complain, it would allow for a real focus on early resolution of complaints, and it would also deliver effective redress for those who are complaining. And in terms of you as public representatives, we think it would show a value of complaints culture, it would simplify complaints, it would allow for data on complaints and allow you to look at the different public sector bodies and understand that process of complaint. And I know when I talk to other MLS, they often talk about the people who come through their constituency offices and complain complain and what that experience is like and hopefully for those people and for you in your role it would make that clearer easier and more effective and um, so we have outlined how we would approach it and I'm more than happy to take questions in terms of any of the information we've provided. Margaret that's great thank you very much indeed and I suppose um, you, you definitely should be talking to a room full of people that are keen and eager to, to engage with yourself because as you've highlighted um, much of the work that we do within our constituency office is about relaying um, your problems and concerns that people have had uh, with various public bodies and, and the sort of complaints um, that, that they have and I suppose on that then 
maybe there, there, there's um, two questions that I wanted to ask. Maybe one was, could, could you just take us through the very procedural basis of what we have to do as part of this? Because uh, obviously, as you say, it, it did maybe begin life in a previous um, committee with chaperone the department that's not there. But just it, it, it come to us if we are happy with what we hear from you today, et cetera, what, what would happen next? And the other question that I have is about, do you know, how, how do you think that we can move to, um, I suppose, to a space where complaints are, are certainly not seen as positive, but that they are seen as something that we can learn from, that we need to be open to them, that we need to extract the learning from them to make the services better so that people don't feel that they have to hide their tracks when there's a complaint, that they, they have the space to go, right, OK, look, didn't do it great there. Let's take the learning, and this is what we could do going forward. How can we move into that space? Okay, um, so in terms of procedure, um, NIPSO have written to the Assembly Commission to ask them to commence um, this part of the Act. And as part of the Commission's consideration of that, they have asked the Assembly Audit resources and the Assembly Audit considered that and written to confirm that in terms of our budget there are appropriate resources in there. So what NIPSO have or what the Commission have asked your committee to do is just to have that scrutiny conversation with NIPSO. So to look at what we have given you in terms of what the Complaint Standards Authority would do, its aims, its approach, how we have set out our process for engaging with public services and how we would take the process forward. Um, if the committee is content after discussion with me that we have done that appropriately, um, then the, you would write to the Commission to say that you are content for um, CSA to be commenced. That, that doesn't mean we begin right away. Um, what that means is we'd be allowed to draw down on our budget to put some staff in place, and then we would do our public consultation on the statement of principles and that statement of principles would then go to the floor of the assembly for and once that was approved by the assembly then we would actually begin looking at the different public sector bodies dividing them into different sectors and deciding which sectors we are going to work with first because it won't be possible for us to do all of the sectors at once, but we would hope in the first 18 months to have two sectors through, and we've developed, um, as you will see, a set of criteria for which ones we might choose to go with first. So in terms of the second, um, and, and I think Sean might want to come in and say something on this, so I actually think it is really, really important that complaints are seen in a positive light. And I think that's about culture. And it's in some respects, you know, most of us weren't complained about. Um, so I think it is about creating a space that allows people to try and resolve that early. And the CSA procedure would actually give people around five days to resolve a complaint at its source as early as possible before moving to an investigation stage. And I think it's that opportunity that can really begin to change that culture. For me, it is also about buy-in. So I think you need buy-in to complaints at the most senior level. Um, and part of what I have been doing is really engaging with chief executives and with the different bodies to get their buy-in. Um, so I think CSA plays a crucial role in this, but it's also about us as an episode pulling together some of those threads and themes and learning so that there's a space where people begin to see complaints as something you can learn from rather than a negative. Sean, I'm not sure if there's anything you'd like to say on that. I think just in terms of adding to that, you know, there is the structural piece around CSA, which is the standardization and the simplification and the clarity around process. But I think as Margaret has alluded to, the big issue here is a cultural shift, you know, and I think part of how we would hope to achieve that is through engagement and through training and resources so that people feel equipped and able to deal effectively with complaints that they don't become defensive, that they see things as an opportunity to learn and improve. 
So I think you know we see training and support actually as we move through the sectors is really important for that cultural change. Okay, the model complaints handling procedures will give us that shift in terms of the structure around it, but actually to really achieve it is that cultural change where where people actually do start to see, you know, complaints as something of value. They're the feedback from the citizen, they're their experience of, of dealing with your service and you want to know about that. If they don't tell you about it as a complaint, they will be saying it to people anybody anyway. So you're better hearing it and then adapting and improving your service so that getting people to recognize the value of, of people's stories um, through their complaint and, and making the change and learning from that. Okay, th thank you for that, John. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask Doug. Doug, do you have anything you want to come in on there? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm very briefly, Margaret, uh, thank you um, for that. I, I mean, I guess I, I'm very supportive of this in, in many ways, but, but there is information I, I, I would like to have. But can, can I ask you just sort of a, one question with, with, with two parts to it? Um, I, I can see the issue about you can only do certain sectors at a time, and, and those sectors where most complaints get are likely to be planning and, and health. Um, certainly, I'm dealing with planning issues which go back some over 10 or 15 years. So the first part of the question is, would you envisage that that complaint standard authority would have a legacy role of complaints? In other words, would you be looking back at previous issues that maybe not been resolved properly and that complaints authority would look at it? Uh, and the second part of that, and I raise it deliberately and not directed at you, is what if the complaint is against your office? Um, you know, if, if, this is, if this is your complaint standard authority, but the complaint is against you, who looks after it then? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll come back on both of those, but I'll also ask Sean to come in in case I get some of the technicality wrong. In terms of, a, I know we have a number of legacy planning issues still around, um, and it kind of depends where they are in the complaints process, if that makes sense. So if they have already been dealt with and come to us and there's, and there's been an investigation and a report, then that is done and dusted, and we can't go back over that. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not learning in that for people, and there's not that we can't pull some of the threads of that together and share it with people. So it kind of depends where it is in the process. Um, in terms of complaints against us, we do, as you would like to hope and expect, have a complaints process. Um, and people do complain to us. I suppose, ultimately, one of the things when people are unhappy with us is that they go to judicial review. Um, so in terms of where that tends to go, that is tends to be the route for it. I know Sean will correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, we would work quite hard to really listen to people complaint. I have actually done quite a lot of engagement since I came into role. So I want to be very clear that I have a very open door and that open door is to listen to when people have been happy, but also when they've been unhappy with however it is we've done in the office and also to re reflect on that. Um, but we, in that sense, we can't adjudicate on ourselves. So if we'd ultimately go to JR, and I'm just going to check with Sean, I'm right about that. We are, Margaret, that, that is the process. So, so why do we have that internal process about the manner in which we've delivered our service? And, and you know, we do look at that thoroughly. And, you know, we're, we're like any body. There are times when we think we could do things better and we would accept that and seek to put things right. But ultimately, where, where people are dissatisfied with how we've conducted something or the decision we've made, the route to, to challenge that when, when we have reconsidered it and looked at it and thought through it is by judicial review. And, and if I could just follow up on that, and, and thank you for that. I mean, it, it, it's really quite interesting. But in this proposal, then, if there's a complaint against anybody else, then the Complaint Standards Authority could look at it. But if it's a complaint of yourselves, then it would have to go to a judicial review. Is, so, is that right or is that fair? Is that balanced? Is that... Is that really what, what, what we want, or, or can the complaint standard authority not be distanced enough from you to be able to then um, conduct an investigation against you if they had to? Is that, is that, is that not possible? So, so Doug, there are two slightly different things. So the complaints, so if, so if a com, 
a public body gets a complaint and it's not resolved as it currently stands, that complaint comes to us. So even if nothing happened with the Complaint Standards Authority, that is still the current process. So the investigate that and honor both the complainant and the public body the opportunity to comment on the draft report and take account of and then they'll come into a decision. So that stands almost regardless. The Complaint Standards Authority bit is about working with, for example, all of the trusts or all of the councils to say, let's work with you on your complaints procedure. What's well, a really, really good complaints procedure? Two stages. Let's set out the amount of time that each stage will get. Let's set out what a complaint actually is. So this is how you know it's a complaint. And let's help you set out what kind of investigation you conduct. So whereas when you get a complaint and you can't resolve it initially and it goes to investigation, what should you be doing to make that a really good investigation? So that the Complaint Standards Authority role is actually about supporting those public bodies to have really, really good complaints procedures and complaints procedures that are similar in each sector so that if you go as a citizen to complain, you know that there'll be two stages to this. This is how it will happen. So bit about the complaint is a standard common role that is the same right across all of the jurisdictions. This bit is about really supporting the each public sector set of bodies to get the best complaints procedures and approach possible. And then for us to be able to have that data to share publicly around the numbers, the kinds and the outcomes. If, does that make sense? No, it, it, it does, um, Margaret. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're dropping out a little bit, but I got, I got the gist of what you're saying, and thank you. I'll, I mean, I need to come and speak to you sometime about Warringstown, Grange and Rath uh, and Knock Ivey uh, near Bambridge, but I'll leave that to another day. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. And I have an open door. I've been saying very, and I mean it, I have an open door, so please do. That, that was a great wee slide there, Doug, to try and, and get <laughs> sorted in there. So, okay, um, Pat Sheehan, you're looking in there. Thanks, Joe, uh, and, and thanks very much for your presentation, Margaret. Uh, I mean, I don't think anyone would disagree with you that we need a, a streamlined complaints procedure. Uh, and Doug there highlighted uh, the planning problems, but... I want to major on the issue around the health service. And I have been involved while I, while I was on the health committee and numerous scandals were literally hundreds of people uh, had complaints uh, and grievances uh, about the treatment either of themselves or of their family members. And you've already mentioned Mucklemore yourself. You've, uh, you know about the neurology you mentioned hyponatremia uh, and, 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 and other issues. And the seem to keep coming at us that the Home Truths report was another issue. And part of the difficulty is, is that people often get pushed from pillar to post. So, I, I mean, I get the impression that the ordinary person in the street thinks the RQIA is there to deal with complaints and they phone up the RQIA and the RQIA say, no, we don't take individual complaints. Uh, and then they're pushed to the patient and client council or the public service ombudsman. Uh, and, you know, it's not right that if somebody has a complaint, particularly if it's a serious complaint, that, that, that they get uh, sort of pushed around like that. Uh, so a streamlined complaints procedure, particularly in the health service or relating to the health service, would, would be very welcome. However, there are a couple of problems in relation to that. Uh, one is culture and the other is uh, accountability. Uh, and I'm talking about accountability at a, a senior level. And just on the, the briefing paper that we got, um, it says in it, 
and I'm referring here to the hyponatremia inquiry. The inquiry highlighted that doctors and other healthcare professionals do make mistakes and must admit to those mistakes when they are made. So it's also vital that there is learning from these mistakes and everything possible is put in place to ensure they're never repeated. Now, the major problem in hyponatremia wasn't so much that a mistake was made. And if you talk to patients or their families who have been on the wrong end of mistakes that have been made, the vast majority of people accept doctors like the rest of us are human and will sometimes make mistakes. The problem in hyponatremia was that mistake was covered up and the senior management in the Belfast Trust circled the wagons and set about trying to protect the reputation of the trust rather than dealing with the issues that were there. And to a large extent, that problem still exists. And one of, one of O'Hara's recommendations was that there should be a duty of candor on all uh, employees in the health service and that it would carry a criminal sanction if, if uh, individuals uh, weren't candid. And there's, from what I can gather, fairly widespread resistance to that recommendation within the health service. So that's, that's part of the issue of culture uh, that exists. Uh, as, uh, in there. The, the other issue is accountability. And you mentioned Mucklemore as well. And Mucklemore, you said there had been no complaints uh, and that should have raised a, a flag in itself. But I, I have talked to quite a number of individuals who had made complaints even before the actual scandal that's being dealt with now in the subject of a public inquiry came to light. And the, the only reason it did come to light was because CCTV was operational unbeknown to the people in Muckamore, uh, including staff and, and patients. And it's just hard to believe that the abuse of uh, patients in Muckamore only began when the CCTV started running. It had obviously been going on for a long, long time, and it was part of the culture in the place. And the difficulty is, uh, and I, I've no doubt that people will be held to account for the actions they were responsible for, and I hope that does happen. But no one at a senior management level uh, is taking responsibility for any of that. And, you know, you've highlighted reasons, uh, you know, uh, it was outside the sort of geographical area of the Belfast Trust uh, it was sort of under the radar a bit. The Belfast Trust didn't really keep a close eye on it. That, that, that's not good enough. And, you know, if you, and I've mentioned this many times before about the Zimbardo experiment that was carried out in Stanford University, where an experimental prison was set up and students were just randomly assigned to be a prisoner or a guard. And within a very short space of time, that experiment had to be abandoned because the guards were abusing the prisoners. Now, the learning for that from that is where there isn't proper oversight and accountability and where some individuals have power over others, there's going to be abuse. Uh, and, and for that reason, and that reason alone, uh, when, when senior management doesn't keep a proper eye that particularly in situations where there are very vulnerable patients, uh, abuse will take place. And we saw the same thing happening in the in the neurology scandal, and that's been well documented as well. So, and I don't want to be too negative, and I appreciate what you're, you're trying to do in setting up a proper streamlined complaint procedure for uh, public services. But how do you deal with those problems that I have alluded to there? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I, I would want to be, well, I want to say two things. One, immediate 
likely before um, taking up role, I was director of MENCAP, so I should say in that role. In fact, Pat, I think I met, met you in that role. In yes, that's in right. That's right. Um, so I am familiar with Muckamore and my office had no complaints. Um, it was one of the things I asked when I took up post. Do we, did we have any complaints from anybody in Muckamore? And we didn't. And so there's a number of things. You have to be tenacious and determined. So you have to go or of the public body and ask well, a, you have to be brave enough to complain. And C, if you're not satisfied, you have to be able to find your way to, to my office to look at a next independent investigation. So there are a number of things for me around that. And I'm not saying it's a panacea because you and I both know that that's a long road. One is culture. And I think if you complete, if you create a much more straightforward complaints procedure, then you start to change the culture. B, you give people access. You don't actually pe keep people waiting two years or three years, which I have seen, while they are recycled around and around and around a complaints procedure, possibly in a trust. You put a, a really clear defining timeline on that. You say you've got 20 days to investigate this and give the person a response. And if the person isn't happy, then they can come to the Ombudsman's office. So you, I think if you put it in place, you might prevent some of that where people just get given information, 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 and don't actually get to any resolution. And the other thing for me is, you, you start to shine a light where those trends are. You know, so if you'd had the data around the number of complaints in Muckamore and in different hospitals and in different settings, then public representatives would have had that data and might have said, why is that so low? You know, what's happening there? So there's a number of things for me. I mean, it's sorry, not sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. I just, I, I just want to, to, to mention one issue in relation to Muckamore, because it, it's not true that there was no data. In, in Muckamore, for example, the use of seclusion was documented. And in some instances, a low seclusion was only supposed to be used as a very last resort. On, on occasions, um, patients were put in seclusion 70 or 80 times a month. And when I spoke to the RQIA and asked them why that didn't raise a red flag to them, they didn't have an answer. So here was the regulator coming in to uh, carry out an inspection. They had the data and they didn't do anything about it. Uh, and, you know, those are problems, problems like that that need to be resolved. And I would Margaret, say that data wasn't in the public domain. Margaret, just before you come in, I, I, I get that this is a really important issue and, and I respect Pat for that, but could you give your answers in principles rather than specifics? Yeah. Because otherwise, we'll, I don't want this yeah. to get into that because yeah. then everybody will want to come in with their own specific issues. But I think Pat's making some really valid points about the principle of where these things are happening and there are red flags. Where will this new policy come in and manage those red flags that are there? And I think what it will do is highlight those areas. I mean, it will take a period of time to put in place, but it will that that data will be in the public domain, and, and people will actually be able to look at it and examine it. We will look at it and examine it, and it'll highlight where there are some of those issues. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank yeah. you. thanks for that, Pat. They're really important issues, and 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 I know that from from the discussions on the health committee as well, and. Um, but um, Trevor Long, you're looking in next there. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just, just briefly, um, I'm interested in the, the discussion so far. Am, am I right in thinking that um, under, under the procedure that you're now proposing, that if, if an authority was deemed to have just refused to cooperate with this uh, protocol, would, would you have the option just to, to make the award against the authority? Without further ado, 
Are, well, what procedure would you have to follow through to make them play ball? So, clarify, are you saying if we were working with, for example, all the councils and one of them said, we're not prepared to sign up to this or we're not prepared to be compliant? Well, Is that if, what you mean? If, if they were guilty of what so many authorities have been guilty of over the year, and I'm not bore you with the details, but I've got one on my desk here. There's only a dispute over hundred pounds. I started in 2012. It's still going on. It's against the care home and one of the trusts. Hundred pounds, uh, and it, it's gone dead for the last uh, year, obviously. But prior to that, I was term hurry trying to get any action at all, and I just wondered, uh, maybe with a, a threshold, if it would be possible that you could just um, just say, okay, we've had enough of this. We we fight in favour of the complainant. <laughs> Well, and, that, and those complaints would come, even now, a complaint like that, if you've exhausted the yeah. public body's procedure, can come to the Ombudsman's office and we can take a view on it. and um, We can investigate and take a view. So that is something that could happen even now. Um, yeah. And if people weren't compliant, then we have, and I maybe ask Sean just to say a wee bit about that. So if people said, if we're not prepared to implement this, we we're not prepared to be clear about what our complaints are, or we're not prepared to sign up to the statement of principles, then there is a process for us to work with that authority to make get them to be compliant. I suppose eventually and um, that if an authority absolutely refused to comply, that would probably come back to the assembly for um, the ombudsman. Bye. And Sean's nodding his head at me, but I'm just going to ask him to check. Yes, Sean? Yeah, I think that's right. So I suppose there's two issues, Trevor, from what you've raised. There's the broader issue, which is about non-compliance with the complaint stand handling procedures. So if, if an organisation in its entirety wasn't prepared to sign up to, to the new standard we set, then there are provisions within Part 3 of the Act to enable us to make them put in place a procedure that's compliant. Then there's the issue about individual complaints which which are caught in in the hamster wheel but but going nowhere which really the complaint standards authority is about dealing with it is about you know the organization seeking to resolve and trying to resolve as many of them as early as they can if they can't then looking at it and then if if, if they haven't uh, resulted at that point the person comes to the ombudsman as the final part of the complaints process or a final adjudication on it while we can't say, because it's both the decisions we make are based on, on, on the evidence that's presented, but, uh, but ultimately that is the role of the Ombudsman to make an adjudication on that. If that then isn't accepted, then as Margaret has alluded to, there's a process where, where we can bring that matter before the Assembly to say that you know the Ombudsman has made a recommendation and the body has not accepted and implemented that you know, for their attention to, to the appropriate committee, I would assume. Yeah, thanks for that, Sean. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that if, if if the assembly hadn't collapsed in 2016, this would have been up and running long ago. And I think it's, it's certainly it's time has come. You know, if you went round to every MLA here, you would discover similar frustrations around these complaints. So, and just the last thing on the on the, the situation that Doug raised of a complaint against uh, yourselves, presumably that would be a complaint. On, on the basis of the decision you've made. Uh, and I imagine that even at the moment, they, they just go straight on to judicial review if they, if, if they want to accept your finding. So that, that's still the case, isn't it? Yeah, I'm nodding my head. Yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah. they have to have leave for judicial review, which is partly about is there enough evidence there to suggest that our decision was an error or was not appropriate? But yes. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I hope you can progress this as quickly as possible. I've had a fair bit of dealings with your organization. I've never had a complaint against them about the way you've dealt with them. Now, I'll go back to two, two previous ombudsmen, and uh, I just hope this, this progresses quickly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Trevor, and get in there with that query about your 100 quid, whenever that is good, and that will be sorted yeah. out, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, George, do you, I, I can see your hand covering the the camera there. I assume that means you're looking in for a question. Do you want to come in there? Yes, I do, Chair. Yes. <clears throat> okay, go um, ahead. Just to thank Margaret and Sean for their pre presentation today. Um, one wee question I'd like to ask them is that from an accessibility point of view, 
Um, we're, we're up here in the Northwest, and um, if, if someone, just using this as an example, someone wanted to see them sort of privately, um, where, where have they to go to, to meet up with them? Um, so, I know in normal times, um, we would often go out and meet, and meet people, so that, that's not a problem at all. Um, and obviously, at the moment, you know, our, our office is closed, but we're certainly doing virtual meetings. Um, and I have begun a round of reaching out to all of the parties. I've, I've done some of them, not all of them, but also to make political representatives aware that they can come through to the office. Um, and I'm just trying to ensure that people know how to find their way to me. I mean, I, I think the accessibility issue is an interesting one, and I think we have some work to do as an office about making ourselves really accessible. But there would not be a problem, um, George, at all, about us finding a way for someone to meet with us. And um, certainly the committee clerk has my details, and you could reach out to the office or, or give someone those details if there was something in particular. Th th thanks for that, Chair. One more supplementary. How many staff would you have? I'm looking at Sean. I'm going to say 42, but I'm not sure if that's totally right, is it, Sean? I, I was going to say 43, you know, in terms of full-time. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I think, you know, and and, and obviously if, if, you know, Complaint Standards Authority, you know, is commenced, you know, the, the Audit Committee have approved a budget which would it would enable us to, to appoint two staff to take that forward. That's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. And, and, and quite the question to put you on the spot there, Margaret, but we appreciate certainly that you have been appointed during COVID and in fact haven't been able to actually, yeah, I'm sure, even meet many of your staff in person. And, and that certainly is uh, something I'm sure a number of people are facing, but something that you're facing. And, that, and that's not easy to get into a new role and into uh, heading up an organisation during COVID whenever you can't actually get the chance to meet people face to face. But Hopefully that, that will be something that will come in the months ahead. The, the final person, just going to double check, I think from memory that Martina Anderson's hand may have been up from the last contribution, but I'm just going to offer Martina a chance to come in if she wants to. Um, she's just okay. not her. Alan, I, I was trying to comply yep. with all your rules and I lowered my hand. And then I put it back up again. <laughs> you did it so quick and it <laughs> Okay, so Margaret, first of all, can I congratulate you on, on, on taking up this new role? And I want to concur with what Pat had said because we need to ensure that the, the complaint process is robust and enforceable. Um, I think without a doubt that complaint standard authority powers, they need to commence and we would support that based on what you sent in to us, what was presented to us uh, in the pack, and also then what you did uh, today in terms of the evidence before us. Now, it is it is concerning that the data, whatever about how it had been collated or collected, because it seems to have done neither, um, but as Pat has said, it has been there. So the fact that data is not collected and then collated to inform and indeed to transform the culture of complaints, I find somewhat more worrying. And, and we need to make it e easier for constituents to complain. We need to have a mechanism for redress. We need to ensure that it's clear and it's a transparent landscape. And it's none of that at the moment. And we all know that and we all could give evidence of things that are happening in each of our constituencies that um, that would need the kind of confusion removed. So I'm glad that you've presented to us today in this way. And I just want to support what you've said with regards to the powers need to commence and they need to do so soon. So Chair, whatever we need to do to take this to the next stage, I think as a committee, we just need to, uh, after this presentation today, we need to move, uh, act and act quickly. So thank you, Margaret. I don't, don't have a question for yourself and Sean today, but you can rest assured I probably will be coming to your office like others and a failing of the opportunity to assist us here in this constituency of Derry. Thank you, Martina, much appreciated. Okay, members, thank you uh, very much for those questions. And Margaret and Sean, thank you very much for your presentation with us today. Uh, thank you as well for the fact that we were just a little bit delayed at the beginning as well, time-wise. So we appreciate you holding on to that. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. And we will 
uh, have our discussion that we need to have afterwards now and uh, hopefully get us progressed. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Thanks to members for their time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, members, uh, do we have agreement then to write to the speaker to inform him that the committee is content uh, that now would be an appropriate time to commence part two of the Public Services Ombudsman Act Northern Ireland 2016? Would there be agreement for that? Yes, we can agree. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much, and thank you, members, for that. Then we can move on to item 13, the Forward Work Programme, which is on page 129 of the meeting pack. Are members content to note the contents of that? Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in correspondence, then, item 14 of the agenda, there are 10 items of correspondences on page 136 to 170 in the pack. Um, if you're content to note them, there's just one that I want to draw attention because I need approval uh, for the clerk, is that there was um, a letter from the Economy Committee which asked us how we were engaging with the EU Commission. Uh, it was more or less just asking us how we were doing that. So if members are agreed, then we can let the clerk reply uh, for the back to the Economy Committee just to let them know of our engagement. Would members be happy enough with that? Agreed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, item 15 then is any other business. There is just uh, uh, one issue. Uh, on the 18th of February, the First and Deputy First Minister answered a question on the Commission of Flags, Culture, Identity and Tradition that a report had been completed uh, and that junior ministers met with the Commission in October and officials in January and that a working group had been established to take matters forward. The Minister for Infrastructure on Monday stated that she was not aware of a working group and that her officials were not involved in such. So what we were simply going to do, given that the flags and um, the flag culture, identity and tradition has uh, a report which hasn't been published, but there is now a working group established as a result of that report. I think maybe we just need to contact the department just to sort that out because in the interest of openness and transparency, if a... Uh, if a, a body is reporting and then there are actions and they are being acted, but people don't know that it's being acted and we aren't aware of the report, I think we would just need to regularise that and get some clarity. So would members be agreeable if we seek that um, clarity? Yep. Okay. Um, members, is anybody else any other business? Okay. Uh, yes, go on ahead, George. Just to, just to thank you today for letting me in for... A, a couple of uh, a couple of th uh, items there, uh, very much very much appreciated, and uh, I'm sorry uh, in the past there times I wasn't able to get in, but uh, it makes such such a difference when, when I can take part in the in the meeting. Thank you very much. Absolutely, George, and we are aware that that maybe that ha raise hand function isn't working with the way that you're engaging with the committee. So uh, I'm sure other members will will totally accept that that they'll be happy if I call you in by person um, whenever we're having segments. But that I will say is special treatment because obviously if we can't go around all uh, nine members asking them do they wish to speak on each item, or else we would spend most of the day asking people if they want to come in. But everybody else can can use the, the function, George, but I'll certainly call you in uh, on each of those items. We're ha happy to do that for you. Thank you and very great, much. Great to have your contributions today as well. So thank you for those as well. Thank you. So, um, folks, the um, date time and date uh, are, uh, for the next meeting is next Wednesday, uh, the 10th of March, again by Starleaf. So thank you all very much for your participation today. A long meeting again. I shall set the challenge of meeting, making next meeting, week's meeting a little bit shorter. But thank you for uh, sticking with us, and I'll see you all again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.